We're going to start to run this thing. See if I can get my brain to work and make it all happen. One, two, three, go. Okay, guys. Welcome back to uh, VOR in the last day in this studio. Yes, this is a special show for us because this is the last show in the VOR studio. We've been here for almost three years. Um, this is going to be where our future uh, soon-to-be fourth member of our family is going to join us. This is going to be the baby area. So I've been remodeling the upstairs and we are going to be moving up there hopefully on Friday. It's not ready to be a studio yet, but whatever. Um, so yeah, last VOR in this studio uh, YouTube show, which is kind of exciting. Thank you for being here. The show that we're doing tonight is, it could be five hours. Every one of these could be five hours. Um, we're going to look at Lucy. Uh, this is tentatively called Lucy Fur. <laughs> See what we did there? Um, everybody knows Lucy, right? The mother of all living. Not. Not the mother of all living. But they say she is, right? And this guy here, Donald Johansson, is the one who found her. What a lucky guy. He made a whole career and a bunch of money running around talking about the thing that he found, which is the thing that he wanted to find because he's an absolute atheist and he wanted to prove natural origins of man. So what we're going to look at tonight, you've seen some of the videos on Can We Trust the Fossil? I'm going to do just a little bit of some of the issues with the fossil, probably like 15 minutes, maybe 10-ish, 15 minutes of that. But then we're going to look at um, where this idea of coming from animals uh, started, what, what the origination of this would have been why and then we're going to really look into donald johansson um i've found a freedom from religion lecture that he did i've watched a bunch of his lectures and every one of them he wants to he wants you to worship the true creator which is nature he wants you to stop believing in the god of the bible if you believe in the god of the bible you're ignorant you're a bigot uh don't teach your children you know this kind of same thing we hear from bill nye and you know all these other yahoos that, that uh teach that you can't uh, you can't tell the children that something created this reality uh we're gonna watch quite a bit of the lecture because i want you to hear his heart position and really what i would say is the motivating factor behind what he discovered which changed what everybody believes about where humans came from and then in classic vor fashion we're going to go a little conspiracy because the name Lucy is suspect at best. The official story is that it was named after Lucy in the sky with diamonds, which is a Beatles song. So we're going to look a little bit into the Beatles and how creepy they are. This is going to be towards the end of it. Um, and uh, when you see to me, when you see it all together, where the idea of this, we came from mud and you know, we're, we are animals in meaningless universe and Donald Johansson, who's one of the preeminent uh, paleoanthropologists pushing this idea. His story isn't always straight. He tells one thing on one lecture and another thing on another. You're going to see that this is just a religious belief system that he's pushing as unquestioned fact. His intention is to get you to believe in his belief system or his religion and science. Basically at this point, natural science is a cult. Mm. a cult not occult ah, some of it's hidden um there's good science right how did uh, how do things work laws of physics electromagnetism etc then there's the speculative origin science where did we come from where did man come from where did the universe come from that belief system that they figured it out through purely natural processes is a cult that you can't question so of all the ironies uh in addition to uh him having an agenda it's very hypocritical what he's saying so okay um should be about an hour, hour and a half, and uh, hopefully we can make this thing make sense. One thing I would ask, it's very possible, his lecture is so quiet, I have to go in into OBS and turn up the volume and then turn it down. So please chat, or Chloe, if one of the videos is way too quiet or way too loud, please let me know, because that's a settings thing I have to fix, because it's almost like they didn't want anybody to hear what he was saying. So, okay, let's get into it. <clears throat> I'm super excited about this. Um... This stuff really writes itself. I mean, I could give you guys all these resources and you could just watch them on your own and go, yeah, I could have done that show. What do we know about Lucy, right? The mother of all living. Let's refresh this. Lucy was an Australopithecus afarensis, mm -hmm. a species of early human that lived between 3.9 and 2.9 million years ago in East Africa. Named after the Beatles song, 
Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. She was discovered in 1974 by paleoanthropologist Donald Johansson and his team in the Afar region of Ethiopia, and her skeleton has since become one of the most important finds in human evolution. Lucy was a small hominid, standing at just over three and a half feet tall. She had a small brain, about the size of a chimpanzee's. Because of the shape of her pelvis and spine and the fact her leg bones were longer than her arm bones, indicates that she was bipedal and spent more time walking on two okay. legs than climbing. Takeaways from this first part, we're going to address a lot of these points. Named after Lucy, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that's really going to be fun towards the end of this. Um, she was small, right? She was the size of a, what are they, I think they say she's the size of a five-year-old. Hold on. I'm in trees. A trait that is unique to humans. She died as an adult, but was only as tall as the average five-year-old. Okay, so she was as tall as a five-year-old. Um, and uh, her pelvis, right, these are the things they said, named after the Beatles song, uh, her pelvis and uh, tells you that she was definitely bipedal and she was only five years old. So I want to start, the very first thing I want to start by showing is this is a lady named Mary Leakey. Now, here's what happened. When they discovered Lucy, they, Donald Johansson, which we're going to cover a little bit. Again, if you just want to nerd out and watch his uh, PBS store, uh, shows about this, the guy's agenda is, is uh, very transparent. But they said what really corroborated these bits of bones found in all these different places, a knee over here and a leg over there and a smashed pelvis over here, it was these footprints that Mary Leakey found. Um, these footprints were found a mile away, but they say and definitely was Lucy's. Now, first thing I... First thing I want to say, these are supposed to be Lucy's footprints or footprints of one of Lucy's, uh, you know, brothers or sisters, whatever. Um, this is an actual sized photo. Look at the size of that left footprint by her hand. Do you think the footprint uh, to the left there by her hand looks like the size of a footprint that a five-year-old would leave? Uh, a three-foot tall five-year-old? Probably not. What about the one next to it? Does that look like the footprint of a five-year-old chimp? human whatever five foot tall three foot tall i mean three foot tall. a three foot tall chimp what look at those paddles if that was the chimp's feet that's uh, very unlikely to me i would want to see if it was a three foot tall chimp uh the height of a five-year-old human uh, a five-year-old human's uh, foot size you know six inches whatever seven inches that is not seven inches that's uh, bigger than her head that's a big foot lucy so anyways, a bunch of issues. Is it her? Is it somebody else? How tall are they? Um, interesting that they would say that. So in the video, uh, the footprint uh, was supposed to be the footprint of a small chimp, and it's a massive footprint. But it corroborates the story, right? And it just so happens that the footprint and Lucy, you'll hear Donald talk about it later, were found at uh, surface level. Mm -hmm. 3.5 million years old. You saw me cover this with the uh, Paul Sereno video with the dinosaurs. And guess where these, they're right at the surface. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, apparently, the more time you have, the more deposition should happen. The more layers of sediment should be added. Unless you need it to be at surface level, like where they found Lucy in these, uh, these footprints. Those are three million year old footprints that we're looking at there. Three, just, uh, uh, you think that's a three million year old footprint? Do you have any idea how long three million years is? And it didn't fill in with dirt or a mountain or anything? It, they're one of the things they preach is the geologic column. Oh, we found the geologic column. It tells us how old everything is. Everything's th everything's three million years old. Everything at the surface. Anyways, that seems to uh, to be pretty unlikely to me that that would happen. Now, um, there's other issues. I could go and read uh, about um, the pelvis. Actually, I do want to show one thing. I want to show one more issue with the fossil, and then we'll go into kind of how we got into this. Uh, whatever this uh, miry pit of lucy uh one more issue with the fossil and then we're going to move on to more of the philosophy and the history of of donald johansson so check this out this is donald johansson who by the way ended up with pbs specials and all of the fame and celebrity for finding this thing you could ever want as a scientist lucy became an almost instant celebrity in anthropological circles she didn't look like anything we had ever found before. She was something very different. And because of that, she opened up for us an entire new chapter on human origins. Lucy turned old predictions upside down. It was thought the missing link would be a smart ape that walked on all fours. 
Here was a skeleton of a creature that looked like it could walk like us, but with many ape-like features. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. Okay, <laughs> to catch you up in the story here, uh, they have found these bits and pieces of these, uh, this fossil scattered about a boot. And uh, they found a knee that's definitely a human knee, and they found a hip that they want to be, you know, Lucy's hip, but it's, um, it looks like a chimpanzee hip. So, <laughs> science, you have a, a problem here. The evidence isn't matting, matching the theory. <laughs> have, we, have we seen this? You've seen me cover this in the channel. Um, we, we thought that we would see forming galaxies. They're fully formed. We thought that we would see forming supermassive black holes. Nope, they're fully formed. Well, we have a choice here make it fit or just say, hey, maybe we're wrong or maybe this evidence isn't what we thought it was. What do you think they do here? But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones have been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. Do you see what he's saying here? It looks like it was a chimp hip, but it's not a chimp hip. What happened, see, is it broke, and then when it settled, it fused together during fossilization. Yeah, that's what happened. It's not a chimp's hip, because we need this to be something else, bipedal. So, yeah, it, uh, it broke and fused, because that's science. <laughs> that happens, right? Just the, bo the bones, they just become malleable again and reform. Watch what he does. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, mm -hmm. perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Science. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. <laughs> they fit so well together. This is impossible. This is not, this is, would not fit um, what a chimpanzee should look like. We can fix this. The perfect the fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. Mm, an illusion. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking tricky. the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. I get in trouble for being critical of science. Can you imagine atheists? I don't know why an atheist would be watching my channel. This isn't TikTok, but if a creation museum took the bone that didn't fit the evidence that they wanted and just used power tools and cut it and fused it back together and said, see, told you, this is the proof. And you'll see in this little uh, video that there's a darker colored hip and a lighter colored hip because they only found one side of it. And so you're actually seeing what they found versus what they think they needed to see. And they literally cut the bone apart and fused it back together. Yep, science. Anatomically, at least, Lucy could stand like a human. Yeah, especially after you made her. The case for our earliest ancestor walking upright was growing stronger. And Lucy wasn't the only evidence. It was growing stronger. You, <laughs> oh man! At this point, I don't, I don't even know what to do with these people with this thing. I mean, it's like, fine, you want to believe it, that's great, but just don't say that it's fact and don't say that we can't question it. Okay, um, <clears throat> this should look a little different than it does, 
but unfortunately it looks like it does. So I have to, this is where it's going to start to get kind of weird. I knew this was going to happen and let's see how it goes. Oh, you know what? What if I get rid of this guy? No, this is the one I need. Okay. So I need to highlight this one and move it over. Uh, this is going to get weird, but okay. I need you guys to know about a certain individual because this is where the Lucy story actually begins. The guy's name is Democritus. Okay. You might not know this name, but you are going to need to know him. I'm going to be covering him a lot in the next few weeks. One such person is Democritus, an ancient Greek philosopher who is viewed by many as being the father of modern science. This is due to his theory that the universe is made up of atoms. Democritus, you guys, this is a crazy VOR nugget. Wait till you see this. <clears throat> Democritus is the father of modern science, philosophically, the father of uh, modern uh, secular materialist science. He lived 500 years before Jesus, and everything that he taught <clears throat> is everything that we believe today. Well, not we, but what science preaches. Check this out. Democritus did not just argue that living and non-living things were ultimate, uh, ultimately composed of the same basic substance, but he also argued that life had arisen from the non-living world. He believed that living creatures originally uh, were generated in primeval mud by the heat of the sun. Democritus believed that atoms are all that there are in the universe, and they smashed together and built the universe. He believed in the Big Bang. He believed that life came from uh, the mud. And so uh, that's like a really cool thing, Democritus. Where'd you get that idea from? He got that idea from, oh, I hope I have it here. Well, you get to see a test of all these things that are coming up. He got the idea from Babylonians, which is kind of a bummer that I don't have it, but I must have lost that somewhere. Well, there's a, I could find it, but I'm not going to. So the idea of, um, Does he have it in here? No, whatever. The idea of life emerging from the mud is actually Babylonian initially. And I thought I had that, but I must have lost it somewhere, which is a bummer. Oh, here it is. Ah, stick with me tonight, you guys. It's going to be a little bit rough like this, but we're going to get it together. Okay. After the water, let me scroll up here. I got so many tabs, so much going on. After the waters of Apsu and Tiamat mix. So this is um the Babylonian creation story. Uh, can I scroll this down a little bit? I guess you're just going to have to trust me on that. It's just above there. This is the Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Eilish. After the waters of Apsu and Timat, Timiat mix, the gods Lamu and Lamu, slime and mud, emerge. Okay. Where are we going with this VOR? The Babylonians before Democritus taught that life emerged from the mud. Democritus taught that the universe created itself through atom smashing and that life also emerged from the mud. Democritus also taught, see, uh, Democritus believed that mankind had originally lived alone as animals. Democritus believed humans originated in mud and lived at first as wild animals before slowly learning enough to become civilized. This is an ancient belief system, which started in Babylon, right? Crazy. Babylon, uh, which is not the uh, God of the Bible's um, uh, allies, right? It's very adversarial. The Babylonians also believed in a flat earth. Sorry, flat earthers. Anyways, this is an ancient origins uh, myth that started in, um, in Babylon. So how would Democritus have uh, also believed this? And he's now the father of modern science when... 2,500 years ago, he was throwing this around. Where did Democritus get this information from? This is Democritus here, called the Laughing Philosopher. That's the guy. That's your father of modern science. Look at this. This is crazy. The precise date and location of Democritus' birth is the subject of the is the subject of the debate. Whatever, that's not written well. While most sources claim he was born in Abdera, located in the northern Greek province of Thrace, around 460 BC, blah, blah, blah. It has been said that Democritus' father was from a noble family. Could you call him an elite? Probably. Democritus' father was the elite. Interesting. How how do you spend your life uh, like studying science? Well, if your father is the, the elite guy, that helps, right? 
He was so hell, so wealthy that he received the Persian king Xerxes on the latter's march through Abdera during the Second Persian War. So Xerxes came through there and he, he, uh, he hung out with Democritus' dad, the king or whatever. It is further argued that as a reward for his service, the Persian monarch gave his father and other Abderites gifts and left several magi among them. Democritus was apparently instructed by these magis in astronomy and theology. <clears throat> this is uh, the Babylonian creation myth story. The universe created itself. Life crawled out of the... Life emerged from the mud. Humans were just animals that as they learned more you know, turned into humans. And Democritus learned this from the Magi's that were left with him as a gift. When I call NASA Babylonian astronomy, astrology, Babylonian astrology, this is what I mean. This is all Babylonian magic, basically, that you have to believe, right? Donald Johansson, you have to believe this. Unbelievable where this comes from. And this is a, you know, a big thing I'm up against with VOR is constantly trying to show people that uh, it's a belief system. You've got a guy like Donald Johansson, who is um, a celebrity in science, an absolute celebrity in science. And he runs around and tells everyone, you will believe what we've found, you will believe what we believe, or you are non-scientific, you are not intelligent, you're damaging your children, basically. This is a really kind of their whole thing, unfortunately. And it's rooted in Babylonian... Um, magic so an important thing to know here is that uh the god of the bible and the uh, babylonian king that was uh they, they weren't getting along right remember daniel and nebuchadnezzar and you'll worship the thing and shadrach Meshach, and abednego not friends so now what i need to do is show you a little bit about who this donald johansson guy is the guy discovers lucy right his pre he was predisposed to trying to find a natural origin model and what's going to happen here for the next uh, probably hour is we're going to watch bits of this lecture and i'm going to i'm going to tilt what's going to happen he's going to say something and i'm going to tilt that's what's going to happen but there's things that he says about atheist morals and about christian ignorance that we're going to just absolutely dispel and you're going to watch his anti-God fervor in action. It's really remarkable. So um, this is a little bit nerdy. Uh, go ahead and watch the video for yourself at some point. But hopefully through this, you're going to really see what this guy's about. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to start with is this lecture. Donald Johansson, the celebrated priest of the religion of science. What say ye, Donald Johansson? what Darwin called the Dark Continent, and it was at a time when the field of human origins, or as it's called paleoanthropology, was in quite a confused state. Not only because of the lack of evidence of specimens, but also because there were radically different, there certainly was room for radically different ideas and interpretations of those few fragments that had been found. Okay, I'm gonna be constantly pausing and breaking this down, I'm sorry. He says there's room to interpret the data. Here we have a fossil. People were believing whatever about it. We needed to step in and we needed to tell you what these fossils meant. So listen to that again. Uh, there was room for interpretation. We stepped in to make sure you knew the truth. Listen. Use state. Not only because of the lack of evidence of specimens, evidence. but also because there were radically different, there certainly was room for radically different ideas and interpretations of those few fragments that had been found. Okay. Not only was there not very much evidence, everybody was just deciding what the evidence meant. We needed to come in with our power tools and destroy the evidence and rebuild it in the image of the thing that we wanted. That's what we needed to do because we're good at science. Now check this out. This is called the Petrusky Lecture. Let me find this Petrusky Lecture. This is unbelievable. Watch this. Um... Share the Petrusky Lecture. 
I really need a producer at this point. There's too many moving parts. The Petrusky Lecture. The Petrusky Lecture Series is held by the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. Mm -hmm. a, scientist take the ch a scientist tackles the challenges of communicating the importance of climate change across whatever. We're going to get, obviously, that's what happens. This video that we're watching is Donald Johansson speaking to the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. It's as close to like Orwellian 1984 thought police as you could possibly have. He's talking to the ones who, just like John, Donald Johansson said, will find the sparse evidence there is, tell you what to believe about it, and tell you what to communicate to the world, science writers. I, I hope you guys, through this discussion, will see the levity of this thing that's going on. This is unbelievable. Okay. It's only going to get worse from here on out. Just like trigger warning, it's only going to get worse from here on out. Here we go. And one of the most rewarding things about being a scientist, I didn't bring, I usually wear this little bracelet that says, what, WWSD, what would science do? <laughs> uh, is to get into a field that is more or less in many ways in its infancy, but at the same time in a confused state because one can make, with discoveries and interpretations, significant contributions to that particular endeavor. With VOR, the, one of the first shirts I made was the priests of the religion of science. I hope you guys are seeing this. And part of why I'm being so critical of this man is if he were to say, you know, we have a belief system and we just believe what we want and whatever, stop us. That'd be one thing, but he's going to say out of one side of his mouth, we tell you what to believe. We take the scant amount of evidence that there is and interpret it into basically bolster our worldview. And then we communicate that to the world. And if you don't believe us, you're an ignorant, bigoted, mor you're a moron, basically. You're, you're an occult. And this just gets like, it becomes more and more evident the, the longer he talks. What WWSD, what would science do? Well, good science wouldn't rely on the thought police to interpret the data you know, and then have a committee of um, heralds of, uh, you know, um, uh, communicators that you go through to tell everybody what to believe and then shame everyone who doesn't believe in their religion. Listen to this again. Use state, not only because of the lack of evidence of specimens, but also because there were radically different there certainly was room for radically different ideas and interpretations of those few fragments that had been found. And one of the most rewarding things about being a scientist, I didn't bring, I usually wear this little bracelet that says, what, WWSD, what would science do? One of the most rewarding thing about being a scientist, by the way, science is God, right? I'm, obviously, we see the what would Jesus do uh, parallel there. And they all laugh. <laughs> yeah, people believe in Jesus. They need to believe in science. What would science do? One of the most rewarding things about being a scientist is I can interpret the data of those few fragments that we have and tell everybody what to believe, right? Because I am a priest of the religion of, uh, you know, of my religion of science. Uh, is to get into a field that is more or less in many ways in its infancy, but at the same time in a confused state because one can make, with discoveries and interpretations, significant contributions to that particular endeavor. And I'm sure many of you, and I'm not going to tell you anything about science writing, you guys are the experts, but you can probably think of many other instances in science that have been rewarded in this way. It's a club, and you ain't in it. I don't have to tell you, science writers, how important our job is here. Yeah, we believe in a natural world, and everybody will believe what we believe. That's just what it is. There's no fossilized bones about it. Okay. Going to the other part of this lecture, that was just kind of a teaser um, to give you like a little heart position. We're here to tell you to the science writers what to believe. You can't question us. It's about science, not belief. And then here he shows up at the um, Freedom From Religion Foundation where they, it's a club and they get to sit here and tell you um, he gets to tell you how stupid God is and how, you know, uh, science should be blindly adhered to. And uh, like, 
one disclosure, I'm not I'm not anti-science, okay? I love science. I'm anti people telling me what to believe about something they can't test, repeat, or observe when their entire worldview is based on trying to disprove the God of the Bible. That's what I'm against, okay? Here's the guy giving the announcement uh, the, uh, that Donald Johansson's going, here comes the priest, here comes the Pope. Listen to what he says. And when we interviewed him on our radio show, I asked him, how did you spot that little piece of bone, ancient bone? And he just... Let me just slow it down a little bit. Uh, one, two, five is good for these guys. People had walked past it and, and they just thought it was dirt and rocks and he saw it as, as his training. He's, he knew exactly what he was looking at. She's a female hominid, Australopithecine, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974, so 40 years ago. The specimen that he discovered is dated to 3.2 million years ago. The first known member of A. afarensis from the Afar area of Ethiopia thought to be one of the direct ancestors of modern humans. And I have to say, five years ago, I had what was very close, or maybe parallels a religious experience, when I was in Times Square at the Discovery Center, where Lucy is on display. Have any of you seen it there, in that area? You can actually go up and see that exact fossil, that exact skeleton that's there. And I went into the room and there were people, but for about 30 or 40 seconds, I was the only person in that room looking at what I thought was my great, 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 great grandma. <laughs> and I got goosebumps, I have to tell you. It was like this feeling of, wow, the continuity and the feeling of how we evolved and where we came from. So, um, in the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the keynote speaker or whatever, the MC, he says he had a religious experience. Mm -hmm when he saw Lucy. That's sweet, isn't it? Oh, Lucy. Where'd they get that name? We're going to address that in a little bit. Okay. Um, let's go down these, uh, the rabbit hole with Mr. Johansson here, the most uh, intellectually honest, clear, transparent, pure scientist you've ever heard speak. Here we go. This has been a very important part of my life, um, the study of who we are, where we've come from. It has immense implications, philosophical and otherwise, from everything from medicine to how we look at one another and how we treat one another. And I truly believe that by understanding the deep roots of humanity, the very simple fact that we now know is based on an out-of-Africa experience where, of course, nothing happens. I mean, what happens Simple in fact. Africa, right? Well, everything. Uh, for so many years, beginning in 1856 with the discovery of the Neanderthal skull in Germany, all these white European males got together and figured out that Europe was a finishing school for humanity. That's going to come up later a little bit with eugenics. You've seen me covered on this channel. I've covered the Otabanga, uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne, the whole um, ethnologic displays and um, how, and you've heard me say it on the TikTok lives, evolution was dreamed up from Babylon to Europe, the, the elites in Europe, to basically make the white European the height of this evolutionary uh, pyramid. The idea being that scientifically they could say, we're better than you. Uh, we're more evolved than you. Do, do you not trust the science? Look at how white we are. We're white, which means that we're far away from ape. And if you're darker colored, if you're any darker than us, clearly you're, you know, closer to ape. You know that in a case like AIs listening or YouTube, I 100% don't believe this. I believe that we're sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We're all cousins and skin uh, colors, literally skin deep. So, but this is what they taught when they didn't have any evidence. Uh, they've been looking for 200 years, and according to Donald Johansson, they have a scant amount of evidence, little bits and pieces. Back then, they had nothing, right? Nothing. And um, that they wanted everybody to believe this because then politically, uh, socioeconomically, they could be in charge. Mm -hmm. This is actually where the theory of evolution comes from. It's Babylonian magic reimagined by the white aristocracy in Europe, the elites, to uh, allow scientifically for them to lead and rule the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christianity's bad. 
The religion that teaches to love your brothers, you love yourself and lay your life down for your brother. We're the problem. When at the best case scenario, they're teaching survival of the fittest. Worst case scenario, it was entirely contrived from a purely racist motivation. To misuse science to justify their tyranny. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Well, that's all, as we say, ancient history. It's not ancient history, Donald Johansson. L let's hear him say that again. And I truly believe that by understanding the deep roots of humanity, the very simple fact that we now know is simple fact based on an out of Africa experience, where of course nothing happens. I mean, what happens in Africa, right? Well, everything. Uh, for so many years, beginning in 1856 with the discovery of the Neanderthal skull in Germany, all these white European males got together and figured out that Europe was a finishing school for humanity. Well, that's all, as we say, ancient history. Why don't you uh, just talk about that a little more, Donald Johansson? Why don't you talk about the fathers of evolution, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin, all the eugenicists? Oh, it's just we're going to sweep that under the rug? Yeah, that's ancient history. Don't worry about that. They were still right about a lot of things, just not that. But it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. And a guiding principle for me throughout my career has not necessarily been discovery driven to find a specimen, although I did on the 24th of November 40 years ago, someone asked me, what's the big difference between you and Lucy? I said, well, when I look at Lucy, she doesn't look a day older. <laughs> but It wasn't necessarily that I was hoping to make this colossal discovery of a creature that has become pretty much an icon in terms of paleontology or paleoanthropology, but it was to understand our place in nature. The book that launched my intrigue about where we've come from was a book entitled Man's Place in Nature by Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a tea-drinking buddy of Charles Darwin I feel like an, uh, enough of you have become familiar with my content and have heard me say these things before. The white eugenicist, Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog. You've seen me make videos on it. So a lot of you are probably like, oh yeah, VOR's already told me about that. I know that. But in case you haven't looked into Thomas Henry Huxley, and I'm going to try and do this, or you haven't seen me look into it. I'm going to try and do this very quickly because I could do, like I said, this could be a five-hour show. I could do five hours on Thomas Henry Huxley and Darwin and O.C. Marsh, who was funded by his uncle J.P. Morgan, and all of these yahoos at the beginning. Henry Fairfield Osborne, uh, William, uh, what is it, uh, Madison Grant. Um, I, If I'm able to do my due diligence, I'll put a card up here on YouTube that says, go look at my Otabanga video, because I cover a little bit of those guys in that. But we need to look uh, kind of quickly here at Thomas Henry Huxley. Uh, this is Thomas Henry Huxley. Thomas Henry Huxley is known as Darwin's bulldog. Okay, Thomas Henry Huxley is the reason evolution was brought to the masses. He was a science communicator. Yeah, he was the Bill Nye and the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his time. And he would debate the Christians about our origins because at the time, nobody in Europe believed this. Like, oh, we come from chimps? No way. That's not what happens. Nobody would believe it. But he wanted to free science from the old guard of Christianity, just like Charles Lael. It was a club, it was literally a club, the X Club. Now, we've heard the name Huxley before. Have you heard the name Huxley before? The evolutionist uh, Julian Huxley, I think from Berkeley. That's his son. Um, have we heard about his grandson? Actually, I think Julian Huxley was, I might have that lineage wrong. doesn't matter. Definitely related. Um, his grandson is one Mr. Aldous Huxley. Right here is um, Brave New World, written by Aldous Huxley. Have you ever wondered how they got he got that so right? It's because he was in the club. Yeah, his great-grandpa, or his grandpa, was the reason why evolution was pushed. Again, I could do a whole study on him, but let's go, uh, let's see here. Biologist, educator, advocate of agnosticism, he coined the word. We, we have the term agnostic because of him. We also have Nature Magazine because of him. Yep, science fact. Nature Magazine, the vaunted scientific natural origins paper. 
Is it peer reviewed? You hear people on my live all the time. You give me the peer reviewed, peer reviewed, burr, 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 burr. Nature magazine, created by Thomas Henry Huxley and his group, mm -hmm. and the the coin uh, he coined the term agnostic. Huxley's vigorous public support of Charles Darwin's evolutionary naturalism earned him the nickname Darwin's bulldog. While his organized efforts, uh, public le lectures, and writing helped elevate the place of science in modern society. Anyways, uh, I'll try and boil this down to a couple of my favorite paragraphs. Following the geologist, Sir Charles Lyell. Now, Charles Lyell is the guy, the geologist is the father, father of modern geology. He's the guy who uh, coined the term uniformitarianism. You see that huge canyon, like the Grand Canyon? That was either made by a lot of water in a short amount of time or a little bit of water over a long amount of time. Well, Lyell and Huxley and Darwin were all buddies, mm -hmm. elite European white buddies. And Darwin needed a long time to go from a tadpole to a human. And Lyell wanted to get rid of the flood evidence, and they both could do this by invoking an inconceivable amount of time. Mm -hmm. Following the geologist, Sir Charles Lyell, which if you question the flood, I mean, okay, I should put up another card. I did a deep dive on the flood video, on the uh, evidence for the flood. Uh, it coincided with the top five video of the flood uh, that I made on TikTok. I should put that card up there if I'm able to do that later. It means I'd have to watch this again, which I don't want to. Anyways, um, I cover Huxley and I cover, or no, I cover Lyell and how the people in the room when he was talking about uh, when J. Harlan Bretz was proving the Pacific Northwest floods couldn't talk about um, what they knew, which is the water and where the water came from because they would have all lost their tenure because their bosses ran science back then. So Barretts took on the world and proved them wrong and proved the, the massive flooding in the Pacific Northwest. Anyways, it was Lyell's teaching. It's Lyell's the reason why like people laugh at the flood today. So yeah, uh, following the geologist, Sir Charles Lyell, Huxley challenged the view that fossils showed a progression through the rocks and he went on to repudiate for those of us that don't know the word repudiate, to refuse, to accept, especially to reject as unauthorized or having no binding force to reject. A Christian-based geology that made humans the culmination of creation. Let's read that again. Huxley challenged the view that fossils showed a progression through the rocks and went on to reject, repudiate, a Christian-based geology that made humans the culmination of creation. Uh, writing alongside Huxley on the Rationalist Westminster Review, an influential magazine at the cutting edge of the 19th century uh, literary Britain, saw his brilliance as counterpoised by a love of provocation. So he, he was a very contrarian thinker. Okay, a little bit more on him. Power and Pope Huxley. This is all Britannica, by the way. I guess you can't see that in this, but it's Britannica. Well, whatever. This isn't like a creationist website. Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley's controversial positions in the 1860s and 70s won the support of an increasing number of his contemporaries, while his research established him as one of the leading scientists of his era. As a scientific popularizer, he was without peer, and he was an energetic organizer and political infighter. These qualities gave Huxley the levers necessary to elevate the position of science in British, British society, and he helped to build a social order in which science and professionalism replaced classics and patronage. A scientific order in the elites of British society. He did not fight alone with these dudes and other outsiders. They formed the X Club in 1864 to advance science. Within a decade, they were parceling out Royal Society posts. Yes, the British Royal Society, which I've also covered. Just a bunch of white European elites pushing their belief system on the world. Their mouthpiece was the reader in which Huxley, answering conservative leader Benjamin Disraeli's uh, criticism of Darwinism, notoriously claimed that science would achieve <laughs> domination over the whole realm of the intellect. Yeah, And Nature, founded in 1969 by Huxley's team. Huxley also served as a president of the Geological Society, the Ethnological Society. There's, there's that word again, Ethnological Society. Some people want to say that he wasn't a eugenicist. Ethnology was the study of eugenics, basically, the precursor to it. Uh, the British Association for the Advancement of Science, the Marine Biological Association, and the Royal Society. 
With seats on 10 royal commissions deliberating on everything from fisheries to disease, he had clearly penetrated the labyrinth corridors of power. Huxley and the Circle argued that better scientific education support for scientific research would produce workers and innovation necessary to maintain British supremacy. Anyways, yeah, it's a, literally a group. It's a club. Yeah, it's a club of, of rich elites who used science to basically um, indenture their role as the, uh, the power structure. Okay. Some of you know that. Some of you don't. There's that again. So when Donald Johansson says, I read Thomas Henry Huxley's book and I was like, Yes, Eureka! I've I've had a religious a religious experience, and I'm going to go and uh, teach <laughs> under my uh, you know Lord Sith Thomas Henry Huxley. Teacher that has become pretty much an icon in terms of paleontology or paleoanthropology, but it was to understand our place in nature. The book that launched my intrigue about where we've come from was a book entitled Man's Place in Nature by Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a tea-drinking buddy of Charles Darwin. And they sat and noodled on the question of human evolution. I can see them in, their, in Darwin's garden in Kent. I hope some of you have been there. I've been there a couple of occasions to visit where Darwin lived and walked. And how they discussed how they were going to bring this shocker to the Victorian world of Great Britain that we actually descended from the apes. And Darwin, as you well know, was very reluctant to do that because he didn't want to upset the household, Emma, who was very religious, his wife. And he only said that light would be thrown on the origin of man until 1871 in his Descent of Man when he articulated a number of scenarios for that. And I read that book, Man's Place in Nature, and I You've maybe seen me read that quote from Descent of Man when he said, in time, the civilized races will wipe out the uh, anthropomorphous apes, the Negroes. That's what he also said in the Descent of Man. Classy, Darwin, stay classy. Christianity is the problem. I realized that the, the importance of this subject, which paleoanthropology wasn't really a, a moniker until the late 50s or so, was that we have a remarkable record preserved in the Earth's geological strata that connect us with the past, connect us with each other, and I think very importantly, as you will hear, connect us with the natural world. We know, every single one of us in this room, who the creator was. And that creator was, of course, Mother Nature. And I will have much more to say about that as we... I'm going to just remind us why we're watching this. This is at the Freedom for Religion from Religion Foundation, and <laughs> who the creator? Donald Johansson discloses who our true creator is, and he says it multiple times. that we have a remarkable record preserved in the Earth's geological strata that connect us with the past, connect us with each other, and I think very importantly, as you will hear, connect us with the natural world. We know every single one of us in this room who the creator was. And that creator was, of course, Mother Nature. And I will have much more to say about that as we get into yes, he this will. discussion this evening. But someone said, what was the most surprising thing about this? Okay, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, he gets more into who the creator is and how we serve her, Mother Nature, in a little bit. But we're going to skip forward just a little bit to here. Man, my blood was boiling Your watching place, this. Probably to many of you, uh, the Earth. Uh, hashtag for tonight is Lucy, forty. For those of you who want to make comments, I was at the National Science Writers Conference last Sunday, and there was quite a bit of traffic. And uh, you can reach me at uh, Don Johansson or the Institute of Human Origins uh, that I founded and where I work in Arizona, at hashtag. I mean at, at Human Origins ASU. So, the thing that alarmed me most about Noah's Ark was, you know, if this creator and Noah were supposed to be such wonderful people, why did they leave the dinosaurs behind? I thought dinosaurs were really cool as a kid. And finally, I did see a plausible explanation. Oh. 
So you, you see the ark sailing. Oh crap, that was today? Now, I began to realize that believing in a creator being, someone I couldn't see, someone who was keeping track of me, somebody who I'd be afraid of, was um, really not my cup of tea. I was much more of a, as we say today. Did you hear his whole thing right there? Let's hear this again. Keeping track of me, somebody. Someone who was keeping track of me. I began to realize that believing in a creator being, someone I couldn't see, someone who was keeping track of me, somebody who I'd be afraid of. I realized that believing in a creator being, someone who is keeping track of me, we all know who the true creator is, right? I'm saying this tongue in cheek. It's Mother Nature. She's brilliant. She created all of these things. And she's not judging us. And he, he goes on to elaborate on this later. Mother Nature doesn't judge you. No. Nope. But God of the Bible does. And we don't like that in atheist, scientific atheism. Of all the ironies that the book that they hate talked about them, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. I know you can't see that, but this is how it is. Trust me, it's in there. They will say, where is his coming? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Yes, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, following their own evil desires. It's crazy to just boil it down to something so simple. And I know we all know this from like, a, just at a really, just like guttural, intuitive level. But Don's whole thing here, and you'll see him say more and more about this, is that he doesn't want to believe in a God that's keeping track of what he does. Listen to him say it again. Now, I began to realize that believing in a creator being, someone I couldn't see, someone who was keeping track of me, somebody who I'd be afraid of, was um, really not my cup of tea. I was much more of a, as we say today, a free thinker. Yep, free thinker. And as I went through high school, I had a very adequate education in a public high school, which we should all bring back. Yeah, he's super into education, I'm surprised. Public education. I lived in Berkeley for years, and my favorite bumper sticker was, if you think education's expensive, try ignorance. Again, and I could probably have just given you guys, anybody in this chat, anybody watching this video, I could have just given you the links, and you could have watched this and done your own commentary. It writes itself. Of course, Berkeley, right? Of course he's at Berkeley. I'm not going to do a whole thing on Berkeley, but... Huge surprise. This is where a huge part of the 60s and the hippie counterculture, all the, a lot of that came from there. Super liberal, obviously. Um, ties into uh, the Beatles and stuff later. But yeah, of course, Berkeley. And during my education, I began to really b understand that if I were to believe in this mythical creator, and you know, we only had one choice, right? I mean, since the downsizing... If you lived in Greece, I mean, we had a whole bunch of gods we could pray to. But now, with cutbacks and so on, we're down to one. <laughs> that I would have to, unfortunately, totally reject my objectivity and logic and leap into total fantasy. And I, I just couldn't see the benefit. I didn't even realize that the first time. He's even making fun of God for being one. I, this whole thing... It's just based on the antithesis to believing in the God of the Bible. The whole thing is. I didn't even realize that. Like, you know, we've talked about this before. God says the earth was spoken, the universe was spoken into existence. No, it was an explosion. God says it was water. No, it was fire. God says we're made in his image. No, we're made in the image of a mutated chimpanzee. He's like, we used to have a lot of gods. That was cool. They didn't judge you. And then we just, with because of cutbacks, we got to one God. This is how far.
This is how far his like anti-God fervency is. He's even mad that there's one God. He would like many gods is good. One God is bad. One God judging me is double plus bad. And then he says he has the nerve, the absolute nerve to say, if he were to believe in this God, he would have to suspend logic. I love this meme. Really? From the rib of a man? It's like the, every TikTok troll. And they believe in this. They believe in this thing, right? Which is more ridiculous. The, that lady that was on my live the other day said that we're just animated dust. And she didn't mean to. She was an atheist. And I was like, you know what you said there? Like the God animated dust, which we are made of dust, or this fairy tale, which is more uh, believable. Dawn, if I were to believe that there, something created this reality, I would have to defy logic and believe just entirely in fairy tales. You defy logic, Dawn, and you absolutely believe in a fairy tale. Dawn, if I wanted to believe in your religion, I would have to forsake logic and the laws of physics, and I would have to believe in a fairy tale. Yes, you kiss a frog and it turns into a prince. That's a fairy tale. Dawn, to believe that something created this reality is not forsaking logic. I don't care what the scientific writers say over and over and over. When you are a child and you intuit how this reality works, you believe that something built this and that you didn't believe that we were chimpanzees. Most children didn't believe. They just don't believe that. This is like, I, I know that I'm built for this as a contrarian, you know, a dash of conspiracy, but just a, my issues with the teacher telling you if you don't believe what I tell you, you don't, you're stupid and you don't understand logic. That really frustrates me. And for him to say that his belief system is uh, logical and rational, but ours is, um, you know, a fairy tale. That really upset, you know, obviously we get that all the time on TikTok, but listen to this again. Good brain. But now with cutbacks and so on, we're down to one. <laughs> that I would have to unfortunately, totally reject my objectivity and logic and leap into total fantasy. And I just couldn't see the benefit of that. Right. Now, why, as we all know, I mean, I, if, if someone in the church doesn't know, he says, therefore God. If I say, I don't know, let's find out. Science is such a rewarding, creative... You know, there's a middle option there, Don, and it's that, uh, how did God do it? I don't know. Let's figure it out. This is cool. You can do science and believe God did it. Yeah, it's not one or the other. That's called a false binary, Don, and that sucks. You're not intellectually honest. Um, Newton was a pretty good scientist, probably one of the greats, and he was trying to figure out how the God of this Bible created this reality, and he did just find science, Don. This is just constantly harping, and he says these things in the uh, you know science writer uh, lectures as well. You believe in God, you're stupid. We don't believe in God, we're smart. It's just a constant, you know, uh, preying on our tribal instincts. And charming way of looking at the universe. That is charming, yeah. So why you're do people a real so charmer, Don. evolution? The grand unifying theory of biology. Think about this. Bring this up with the next, at the next astrophysics talk you go to when they explain the origins of the cosmos and the string theory and particles that go faster than the speed of light so that they're younger when they extinguish than when they were born, you know? And you go home and you think it's all very logical and you come and says, well, what was the talk about? And you go, well, I just really don't know exactly. <laughs> they're trying to figure out the grand unifying theory of the universe, right? It's a pretty big question. I'll just let you guys run with that one. A retiring... No, I won't. He goes, why do people question evolution? You don't You don't question the particle physicists. They tell you how the universe got here and it was faster than light and, you know, bingo bongo. We know... Them. No. You wouldn't question them. Why would you question evolution? How about, how about we question all of it? <laughs> False dichotomy, Jones. Um, how about we question all of it? Because the particle physicists, this was nine years ago, um, we're wrong. Yep, the Big Bang, the universe, the string theory is out. The universe isn't locally real, so they were also wrong. Yeah, 
I, I get it. You guys are scientists. We just have to believe whatever you say. But yes, it was probably the right thing to question them too, John, or Don, whatever your name is. Englishman who went off on a five-year boat cruise once figured out the grand unifying theory of biology. That shows the robustness of the theory of evolution. The same tenet. It is a theory, Don. <laughs> it's a theory. It's actually called the theory of evolution. I'm sorry that you just don't, you're so f disassociated from reality, huffing your own gas, that you think it's a fact, which he's going to tell in a second. It's just, it's a theory, yeah, because we don't know. We can't, it's not testable, it's not repeatable, it's not, it's not observable. We, we can't, wait. it's a theory, yeah. Sorry that science has rules, uh, Don. But, um, and the other thing you could do is go, wow, we still believe in a 250-year-old theory that doesn't make any sense, that defies logic. You could go that way with the two, Don, but anyways, do you. ...that Darwin suggested and proffered in the middle 1800s are still the core theory of I know. biology. Crazy, isn't it? Who would teach a theory this long that, anyways, okay, this is where this I is should probably just, let, I I probably just need to let it keep playing. Freedom of religion, but not from religion in this country. And it starts often very close to home. Darwin, if he were alive today, would probably be very happy with this poster. I want you to support science and reason. So get God's name off the money that we all worship and get in science we trust. I don't think we'll do that, but... I might not be in the right headspace for this tonight. Did you hear his voice? Did you hear his fervency? And he doesn't just say, get God's name off of our money and we need to get that now. He doesn't just say that with gritted teeth. He says, and put in science we trust. This is a battle of worldviews. This is a battle for the hearts and the minds of men. And this is the guy who discovered Lucy. Yeah, and this, it's only going to get worse. It just keeps going on and on and on. First off, God isn't his name. Okay, His, his name as best we know is Yehovah. Jehovah Yahweh. Elohim. Yeshua. So God is just a title. And the deists that put that title on there intentionally didn't use a name. It's just a title. Um, and I agree it shouldn't be on our money. So that's fine. when We agree on one thing. But for him to say, get God off our money and put in science we trust, that dovetails with WWSD, what would science do, right? It's a cult scientific materialism speculative origin science is a cult it's a few pundits empowered by thomas henry huxley and that whole crew you know i'm sure there's a chain of command all the way down chain of custody you can't question them they give you new revelations right this is something that one of my dear friends told me about the other day in uh cult religions like um just sorry, I don't want to be too critical, but like Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism and these things, it's um in these uh, addendum kind of Christian religions, there's always like a guy, a revelator, and you have to go to him, and there's new information. Oh, well, we got a new, we got the new light, new revelation. That's what the scientists do. They get new. Oh, we got this new evidence. He even said earlier, well, I'm going to interpret what this evidence is. I'm going to tell you what this evidence means to the science writers. They get new revelation. They tell you what it means. They tell you that you can't question them. You're an apostate. You are, if you question them in this cult, you are an apostate. And you might get excommunicated. You're a heretic. And their God is the creation. This is an ancient thing, worshiping the creation, not the creator. God of the Bible hates that. Do not hate the do not worship the creation. Worship the creator. His God is nature, and he's a priest of the religion of science, which is a cult. It's often very close to home. Darwin, if he were alive today, we'll how you're brought up. But we see too much in the United States, as I've always said, and before I even knew that there was this foundation, I used to talk about it. So get God's name off the money that we all worship and get 
in science we trust. I don't think we'll do that, but we do need to get that name off of our money. There is no question. Um, and it does this anti-science aspect of religion is what bothers me, I think, most intensely. Yeah, you know what, Don, it's your anti-science religion of science that bothers me the most about you also. So, yeah, that's a two-way street, my friend. Um, it's not anti-science. You know what, if I were to Google this, I try not to go off script, but if I were to Google here, uh, scientific method, it would say that you would need to be rigorously skeptical. Well, it might take a little bit, but um, I'll just cherry pick here a little bit. Rigorously, I spelled that right. Skeptical. Call that some brain fog. It's close enough, right? To be skeptical is to judge the validity of a claim based on objective empirical evidence. If you're being rigorously skeptical, Don, I don't need you to look at the small fragments that you've found and tell me what they mean through your mouthpiece of the scientific enterprise funded and created by Thomas Henry Huxley, who hated God. That's not rigorously skeptical. Um, and it does this anti-science aspect of religion is what bothers me, I think, most intensely. I'm not trying to start a revolution here. I mean, kind of, like a intellectual revolution. It, you can be a good scientist, okay? Let me, let me rant here for a minute. I shouldn't, I need to get to back to playing this video, but you can do good science. You can be a good scientist. You can, you can be a natural scientist and think it's natural origin. You can be agnostic. That's not what I'm like rubbing up against here or like opposing. This, the guy who set out to disprove the God of the Bible, just like Charles Lyell and Thomas Henry Huxley, who made the discovery of little Lucifer and told every, tells everybody you have to believe it. Um, this is what I oppose. And the, the, the hip, to me, it's so hypocritical. It's so hypocritical that this man is sitting up here saying that questioning him is anti-science. Holy Moses. Questioning the fossil, quite literally, that he found with a knee here and a hip there that they broke and they fused back together, that he's ran around, made, I'm sure he's made millions of dollars off finding this discovery that he named after Lucy and this guy with diamonds, and, and at least what he says. Questioning him no wonder he's got so much in this. You question me. You gonna question me? You cannot question me. I'm Don John Hanson. I find I find a missing link. You can't question me. It's the mafia. Okay, what else do you have to say, Don? And it's personified in this cartoon. Welcome to church. You won't be needing that. This this in here. <laughs> Just take this brilliant organ out that has evolved over six million years of natural selection that happens to put us at the pinnacle of intelligent life on the planet, in the solar system, and maybe even in the universe, to be so bold. And just take that out. The universe that evolution gave us, or the, uh, the intelligence that, that evolution gave us. You're going to take your intelligence out to believe in God? Imagine how many people, like if you're a young person seeing this, I want to be smart. I've said this so many times on my life. I want to be smart. The guy, the guy who found Lucy said that if I believe in God, I'm not smart. Don't sit here, stand there nine years ago and tell me that by believing in God, I'm not thinking and then tell me that I can't question the thing that you found. That's intellectually dishonest. He's telling you to believe what he says and not question him. 
And then he's saying that the problem with religion is that in order to believe it, you have to take your mind out. You have to not. Let me ask you this, Don. If I were to question your belief system, how would you how would you react to that? Would you say, hey, well, I got good evidence. Let's talk this through. Or would you tell me that I'm, would you just say I'm an idiot and I don't understand science and, uh, you know, whatever, blast me or censor me? That's what you would do. The, the, the science that he's talking about, he, he is predicated on you refusing to use your mind. But Don, um, where did life come from? We don't know science. Where did the universe come from? We don't know science. Uh, I thought the second law of thermodynamics said that entropy always increases. Yeah, but in this case, it didn't. It reversed. Which time? The beginning of the universe? Yeah, reversal of entropy, random. Okay. How do you know that? We don't, but you can't question us. Can you observe it and test it? Nope. Okay. So you have no idea, but we have to believe it and you're right and I can't question it, right? Yes. That's not using your mind. Dawn, where did life come from? No idea. Could it came out of a vent, lightning, comets? We don't know, but uh, it definitely came from somewhere. You know how we know this? Because we see life, right? And we're sure we've got to figure it out. And if we don't, we'll figure it out. But that's not science of the gaps. You use God of the gaps, but we use science, right? And Go ahead and explain to me, Don, how random mutations created consciousness and eyes and our reproductive systems. Because to me, I see a universe getting worse over time, not better. Um, so in order to believe Don's version, I have to not believe in logic yeah, or the laws of physics. But if I just blindly believe him, blindly, now I'm using my mind. Science. and don't use it. The one thing that we can use to solve any and every problem and dilemma facing humankind. I think we have been given the wrong name by a, another Swede, Linnaeus, who calls us homo sapiens, meaning wise man. You read the same newspapers I do. People shooting people on high school campuses, etc., etc., etc going after people with axes in New York. I mean, we are wise men. We are still a work in progress, a long way from where we should be to call ourselves human. But I think a more appropriate name for us would be Homo egocentricus. <laughs> well, who do you think about most of the time? Come on, admit it, even as an atheist, yourselves. We think about ourselves. We think about our parents, our grand Even as an atheist? <laughs> what? Even as an atheist? Come on, admit it. We think about ourselves. <laughs> well, who do you think about most of the time? Come on, admit it. Even as an atheist. Yourselves. Even as an atheist. See, let me tell you about my God. My God came to the earth that he created and we received him not. And when he came here, he uh, allowed us to spit on him and tear his beard hairs out and gouge him and punch him in the mouth. What, what, was, his, what was he guilty of? Speaking the truth. He was the son of God. He was God on the earth. Yeah, that's what he did. And he laid his life down for us. And as Christians, we are supposed to have that same kind of Christ-like intention. You know, yeah, if you got to kill me, you got to kill me. I hear you. You got whatever. Atheism is rooted in largely disbelieving in the God of the Bible. So, of all, I mean, at this point, we need to like start a like a hypocritical, contradictory. Uh, things that Donald Johansson says bored and it's hard for me to say that because of what's happened on TikTok and people now calling me a liar I don't want to call anybody a liar um, especially if they're not lying but to me this is very contradictory and the reason it's contradictory is when your worldview is based on refusing the truth of this reality which is that God created it God created this reality you're, you are going to have a hard time being intellectually honest and consistent Yes, even as an atheist, the worldview is based on basically self-worship. And look, there's good atheists. I'm not just trying to start like a firestorm with atheists. There's good atheists. But largely it's, you know what? 
I want to do what I want to do. And your God's kind of getting in the way. And so I'm going to just do me. I'm going to do me. So yes, even as atheists, uh, Don. We think about ourselves. We yeah. think about our parents, our grandparents, our children, our grandchildren, maybe five generations at a time. But the earth is billions of years old. Life is three and a half billion years old on this planet. If you, oh, maybe somebody like, you know, a, a, a Steve, uh, Steve Jobs with billions of dollars could conceive of what billions are by laying out dollar bills or something. It's a big number. And we believe that we're the pinnacle of evolution, that everything was designed to make white European males. <laughs> and um, there is something very impersonal to most people. Do you think that that room's filled with white European males when he's saying we think that? Like, and I know he's probably trying to be sarcastic, but there's an old saying which is like, you know, there's no such thing as a joke. I said that saying terribly, but you're never really joking, so that's why you shouldn't make a joke. It's like, oh, I'm kidding. Listen. Males. <laughs> and old on this planet. If you oh, maybe somebody like you know a. Uh, Steve uh, Steve Jobs with billions of dollars could conceive of what billions are. By, by the way, Donald Johnson is certainly a white European male. By laying out dollar bills or something. <laughs> it's a big number. And we believe that we're the pinnacle of evolution, that everything was designed to make white European males. <laughs> and... Um, there is something very impersonal to most people about natural selection. It isn't uh, touchy-feely like a God that creates us, right? That personally creates us in his image. Who did he look like? You, 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 that one over there? He was, right. We created him in our image, hmm. obviously, not in his image. No, Don. No, Don. That's not what he meant by uh, we're created in his image. He looks like me. He looks like you. No, I think you should probably research what in the image would be. It's the idea, the concept. Um, we can create. Uh, we have uh, love. We have jealousy. We have fear as these things. Nice straw man, though. Don, you better hope you're right that we created we created God in our image. You better hope that you're right. Because if you meet him, he's going to be very upset about that. We did not create God in our image. We are created in his image. It's the it's reversal of the truth. It's like... Again, I don't want to call him a liar, but it's uh, anti-truth. You often see, and sometimes even television documentaries go at this in the wrong perspective, Darwin is dead. No argument with that. <laughs> he is dead, I agree. Evolution is just a theory. Right, you know what? Isaac Newton, dead too. Right, but gravity ain't going away. Even if his ideas were called the theory of gravity. Oh, he hates that. I regularly lecture. He wants so badly for what he says to be a fact. New yeah, theory. He's called a theory. Let's just be honest, Don. Uh, you worship yourself, and you want everything you say to be a fact, even if there's no evidence for it. Hey, there you go. There's my gauntlet for you. You worship yourself. You got no place in your heart for a god to worship, and you want everything you say as a white European scientific male to be a fact. And it pisses you off that it has to be a theory based on the rules of logic and reality. To colleges, universities, museums, and it's always interesting to say, raise your hand if you believe in evolution, and, and you know, certain percentage. Uh, the only place where less hands would go up than the United States is, of course, Turkey. And we're second from the bottom. Um, and I say it may all surprise you that I don't believe in evolution. 
So yeah, what he's saying now is there's people in America, a lot of people in America still believe in Christianity and the Bible. And so we're second from the bottom. Second from the bottom because we don't believe in evolution. Did we not get our uh, bonus, our uh, quarterly bonus for uh, uh, compliance with the theory of evolution? Now he gets really mad. People don't believe in evolution. Watch this. this big sigh of relief. Any more than I believe in gravity. <laughs> Doesn't take belief. This is a fact. So if you let something go, it's going to fall to the ground. And in biology, going back to Darwin, I think as Jobzanski said, the great geneticist, um, I think I'm supposed to have a blank here. Yes, so you'd have to stare at that. Uh, that uh, in biology, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution is a fact. It's not good. It's not bad. Did you hear him say, evolution is a fact? Did you say, evolution is a fact? Kind of quickly. What if I have him saying that it's not a fact? Would that be intellectually dishonest? I have to turn down the volume here on this one because it'll be too loud. What if I hear uh, our boy Don... say that evolution isn't a fact would that be intellectually dishonest that's my question now again there's some fallout the whole um dan mcclellan said i was lying because the scientists had no evidence for a, a collapsing sand dune and blitz said i was lying because of where i stopped that video even though she said the exact same thing a minute earlier in my video i want i'm accountable to you guys to the viewers if i ever lie i need you to tell me that i'm lying I intend to speak the truth. Um, the Bible says you can't have salt and sw uh, sw fresh and salt water coming out of the same mouth. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Um, I don't believe in the theory of evolution. I don't believe in the Big Bang. I don't believe in the uh, speculative materialist scientific origin model they told us we had to believe in. But I intend to speak the truth. So if I say something here... And then I say something there and they contradict. I need somebody to point that out to me. Okay, remember, Donald Johansson just said, it's a fact. It's a fact. Like mad, right? And what has been so gratifying to me as a scientist is, and you heard earlier about hypotheses that are tested, is that that hypothesis did not have these intermittent fossils here. Uh, it's only subsequently that other discoveries have been made by my team and other teams that have tested this hypothesis. It hasn't proven anything, but it has tested the hypothesis, which still seems to be probably our best introduction or our best conclusions about early human lineages, something that we could not do previously. So, uh, Don, is it a fact or is it a hypothesis? On the scale of truth uh, versus, you know, science, scientific ideas, it goes like this, okay? You have a hypothesis. I think this happened, and if I find evidence to support it, then we can graduate it into a theory. And then if it's a theory, Don, it means it's not proven, but it's the best guess we have supported by evidence. A fact is uh, empirically true demonstrably true he just said evolution's a fact like gravity's a fact we can't he, he said he doesn't even believe in it he said i don't i don't believe in it i i ask people in america do you believe in the theory of evolution and uh, unfortunately the bottom of the barrel of america and there's some people that don't believe in theory of evolution they're stupid and then um he says well i don't believe in evolution it's a fact and then here, it looks like he's older in this video, which makes me think that he's um, maybe understanding he shouldn't have been such a young, brass fellow. Um, it's a fact. It's a fact. So which is it, Donald? Is it a fact or is it a hypothesis? What does he even say here? It's our best guess. Let's listen to how far back he's uh, walked this back. Oh, I'm sharing this and I'm and you're just looking at my face. Man, I hope that you actually heard the video instead of just looking at my face like I was on screensaver. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. 
something that we could not do previously. But today, I'm going to focus more on talking about this wonderful painting by Gauguin. We as humans all ask that question, where did we come from? I want to share this. I didn't mean to, but I want to share this. Who are we and where are we going? Who and are we going? The sorts of discoveries that I have made in Africa have been extremely important for science, greatly, very important for you know, communicating the message about human origins to people. Wow. In many ways, humans are a strange species. Uh, we are the only real vertebrate on the planet that doesn't have some sort of natural birth control or natural control. We are outside of natural selection. We, we don't have reproductive controls on our species, which is danger, as we all know. But we are very different from other animals because we are so highly creative. Because, and I think that that is where everyone's asking the question about what makes humans so unique. I think there are three things. One of them is our use of symbolic language, which we are all doing up here today. Uh, no other animals communicate in that way. <laughs> okay, so we're just an animal, right, Don? Just an animal in the meaningless universe. Okay, uh, well, we're creative. Uh, we use language through symbols. That's weird. There's 7.5 billion living organisms and on this earth. And we depend on cumulative culture. Just in the last hundred years, look at what technology has done, that we build upon earlier discoveries or innovations, and we ratchet that up very quickly. So the cultural evolution is very, very quick. And also, we are the most cooperative species, vertebrate species on the planet. You can use that for good or you can use it for bad. And if you look at our closest living relatives, which would be the chimpanzee, they're in, in great contrast, not very cooperative. We will cooperate with anybody on, on the planet, even if we don't know them and we only meet them on the internet and exchange email. Okay, so uh, I'm going off script here with this one. Um, this is when he was older, and he clearly something's changing with him. Uh, well, a lot of his other talks, we're just animals. There's nothing different about us. We're just chimps. You can see us. And this, he's like, we're like really different from chimps. I don't know why. We're like nice. Like other animals just eat each other. I had a, a, I had a plan with this video to cover the chimps and the terrible things that chimps do. Chimps eating other chimps and throwing their feces and uh, eating their babies and like... Uh, the like the worst gang you know what you could imagine to death and then eating them like it's a like a, every chimpanzee is a hundred times worse than Jeffrey Dahmer every single one of them and everybody's like Jeffrey Dahmer he was the guy which by the way he did that when he was an atheist and if he said that if he wasn't taught evolution he wouldn't have done it whether that's true or not I don't know but um there's something different about us. We're compassionate. We're creative. We use language. I don't know what's different about us. It's weird. It's like every other animal evolved to wherever status they're in, that certain place of animal behavior. And then there's us, and we seem different, but we're not made in the image of God. No, we're definitely also animals. It's just it's so far off the rails. Okay, uh, I've got a little bit of a problem here. I'm realizing we're like an hour and a half in. Uh, I've got to ask the crowd, and I've got to ask Chloe... I've got another hour easily, unfortunately. Too much talking. Um, should we wrap this up tonight and do a part two? Pick it up right here and continue on. You can watch the two together. I could either do it tomorrow. I have a podcast I'm filming tomorrow with JT. Um, what do you guys think? Should we do... I could try to pound this out in 30 minutes, but we haven't even gotten to the cool Lucy stuff and the name and the Beatles and the rest of the Donald Johansson talk. Let me see what you guys say in the chat, and let me check with my wife. Chloe. Yeah. I've got so, this is we've got so much more to do. I've got a good hour to do. Should we do a part two on Thursday? Do the hour. Everyone's supposed to keep going. Is that good for the algorithm? You think to have like this three-hour thing? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're gonna do it. We're going to go. I turned green, and now I turned red. Okay, let's go.
Yeah. I'll try and do this fairly quickly. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, you can just pause it and come back to it. But we, the good, I mean, this is all, I think it's all very important, kind of philosophically what's going on. But what's important here too is that um, we we get to, there's two major points I want to make that need to happen. So, all right, we're going to keep going. Chloe, uh, please give me a coffee. That'd be great. Okay. Let's go. Where are we at? Uh, I forgot that he said humans are different, even though we're not different and we're definitely not made in the image of uh, God. Okay. Um, I'm going to close that one out. I've got like 11 tabs still open. And we are going to go back to the Don Johansson thing. There's a couple really important points here um, that... As we keep catch, this, I guess this video is turning out into like how many contradictory things did Donald Donald Johansson say? Uh, but here we go, part two. <laughs> keep going. Here we go. It has no moral compass. Oh wait, I have to turn this up a little bit. You would have made this a lot easier on me, Donald Johansson, if you could have had this video up loud enough where I could hear it. Okay, here we go. Biology, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution what? is a fact. It's nothing fact. makes sense? In, is, what? What did I just get? What? Nothing makes sense. Um, I think I'm supposed to have a blank here. Yes, so you have to stare at that. Uh, that uh, in biology, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution is a fact. It's not good. It's not bad. It's a fact. It has no moral compass. Or hypothesis. It doesn't, just like gravity, it doesn't care if your grandmother's favorite Dresden China falls to the floor in the middle of an earthquake, which we could have any minute here. Did you see that? I mean, we've all talked about this before on the lives. It doesn't care what you do. It doesn't care who you sleep with or what you do if you're a corrupt psychopath. It doesn't matter. It's... Evolution doesn't care. It's not judging you. <laughs> the aliens, they don't care. They're not judging you. They're going to come and wipe out the earth and the atheists are going to cheer because it was a righteous judgment. At least it wasn't God. <laughs> they don't... Evolution doesn't care what you do. See? Come in. The water's great. Do what thou wilt. Wait till you see this connection between do what thou wilt and the name Lucy. Evolution doesn't care if tens of thousands of people die of Ebola. Ebola doesn't kill you because you're a bad person or a homosexual or some other deviant. It Did you hear that? It won't kill you for being a deviant. You can be a deviant and evolution is not going to kill you. Just it kills you very simply because you don't have a resistance to Ebola. Oh, I see. And your body, those who live through Ebola, who had no medical care, probably have the resistance to Ebola. I've not heard anybody say, like with sickle cell anemia and malaria, let's go find out why those people didn't die. From my perspective, I think that a scientific strategy, especially a biological one, with a full understanding of natural selection, gene recombination, mutation, etc., and a more aggressive approach to Ebola would have gone much further than we have come thus far. But the West, who had the ability to do that, was fiddling away while Ebola was burning its path through Western Africa, decimating people and setting its sights on places like Europe and North America. Human beings care. That's what's one of the marvelous, exciting things about us. Of course, that's why I love dogs. It was a wonderful dog back there. They care too. But we care because of our family values, because of our moral compass, because we are human beings, and because we are alive. And we so often forget what that means. Richard Dawkins, my distinguished friend, who also has one of these pot-bellied naked guys in his house, course, says, Dawkins. essentially, we are the lucky ones because we're going to die. And why are we going to die? Because we were born. Because if there were two genes difference, you would not be you. You would be someone else. Yeah, God we didn't create you. We cherish that. Just and we genes. have to understand that this is an exciting opportunity to be alive. 
and not sit around and worry about some omnipotent being keeping score to decide whether we're going to end up in eternal ecstasy or unending damnation. Make it clear, Donald, how you really feel. Life is too great to spend your time worrying about some omniscient being judging you, keeping score. Like, how many times is he going to say that tonight? You know, as I say, how could he have time to keep score on each one of us? He's so damn busy helping people sink six-foot putts in Arizona and get extra points at football games. He doesn't have time to keep track of us. Sounds like Nimrod. So the problem is that people's prayers don't get answered. Why? Well, here it was in the New Yorker. God finds all the prayers of mankind in his spam folder. <laughs> so we now have an explanation. One of the things about natural selection, which we all grow up learning, is the survival of the fittest, which I was taught by my mentor at age 13, was really the elimination of the unfit. And if you look at it and think about it, that's a better way to look at it. But the problem with natural selection is that you can't weigh it, you can't see it, you can't buy it from Edmund Scientific, it doesn't come in the color blue or in G-flat major, it's where is it? But it is here. And it is that fact that it, one cannot see it, we can only see the results of it, that I think make people so reluctant. They have to see a guiding hand or a guiding force that they can imagine or pray to. He just said, you can't see natural selection, but you have to believe in it. Huh? You can believe in a God that you can't see, but you could, you could believe in him, but... You won't believe in natural selection. Why, why aren't you, you don't believe in this? You can't see it. You can't, you can't order it anywhere, but you're going to have to believe in it. Why don't people want to believe in this thing you can't see? Believe in the thing that you can't see that I'm telling you to believe in. Don't believe in the thing you can't see that you believe in. See, because that's not science. You need to believe in the thing that we can't see that I'm telling you to believe in. And if you believe in the thing that we can't see that you believe in, you're stupid. Donald Johansson, quote. Now, atheists as I guess there are a few in this room, <laughs> get a pretty bad rap. Here we go. Very often. Religious people accuse us of lacking morals, having no family values. Well, unless I'm reading the wrong newspapers, I don't recall any atheists out there beheading people, stoning women to death, or burning people at the stake. Oh, Don, you're doing this to yourself, my man. It's your fault. You did this, okay? I didn't want to do this. You did this. Unless I'm reading the, lo the wrong newspaper. Well, it looks like you're reading the wrong newspaper. Because uh, you've never seen atheists do those kind of things, huh? Just gonna just gonna just say that you're gonna just say the random thing, which is that you don't see atheists. <laughs> Do you even know the inference of what he just said? <sighs> I think as I do these shows, you guys are like getting me more, getting to know me more. The accusation there is that religious people behead and R-A-P-E and do terrible things. But atheist people don't do that. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Dahmer, who literally blamed it on evolution that he did that. He said, if I would have believed in the creator, he said, I believed in the lie of evolution. I'm not defending him, but he, he just, he changed his tune there. So I guess what Don Johansson is saying there, the prestigious truth man who you can't question who wants every word to fall out of his mouth to be a fact he's saying that atheists don't do bad things only religious people do bad things right atheists are good as they self-worship this as this guy's like yeah i worship myself doesn't everybody As 
As a revolutionary, Vladimir Lenin said that a true communist would always promote atheism and combat religion because it is the psychological opiate that robs people, blah, blah, blah. Is atheism communist? Ultimately, however, the success of, com of the communist project depend on eliminating people's demand for religion. I have uh, covered this. I made a video on TikTok about atheism and communism. There's a direct connection. Because basically what they need is uh, Jesus says you're going to serve one master. You can't serve two. So you're going to serve God or mammon. And if God is your God, that's who you serve. There's no room for the state. If you're an atheist, the state becomes your God. Hmm. This is a thing that's very, uh, very much a tried and true part of communism is uh, militant atheism. And we know how that goes. I know like there's people on TikTok that are like, yeah, communism's fun. I'm young and I think communism's fun. I think capitalism sucks, right? Okay, Don. So not, atheists don't do bad things. And uh, atheism, communism is atheism. It's a, it's, you can be an atheist and be a capitalist. You can be an atheist and be non-affiliated. You can be an atheist and a socialist, whatever. But it is a necessary thing in communism that you're atheist. That is the state religion. As the tables indicate, mass murders are perpetrated by dictatorial regimes regimes of various stripes. Communist regimes are far and away the most murderous. The tables list 17 communist regimes that murdered at least 100,000 people. Overall, the communists murdered approximately 168,759,000 people from 1900 to 1987. Yes, Don, you are reading the wrong newspaper. It's interesting that you would say that. At least he said something honestly. There are good religious people and bad religious people. There are religious zealots who kill in the name of their religion. There are religious people who will die for someone. There are good atheists. There are bad atheists. But he just said, unless he's reading the wrong newspaper, he's never seen an atheist do these things. Militant communist atheism is responsible for 170 million deaths over the last 100 years. Stalin, Lenin, Marx. That's not even including Hitler. Because he was, he was an atheist, a cultist, but they don't consider him a communist, right? So add Hitler's totals to that. I'm beginning to wonder what he says that's true. Honestly, and that's, again, I, I'm, tr I'm sorry. I'm not trying, like, I, I, I've, I've taken offense to this whole lying thing. But I, how many times have we caught him in an, um, either him contradicting himself or what he says doesn't match the truth? Listen to this again. Religious people accuse us of lacking morals, having no family values. Well, unless I'm reading the wrong newspapers... I don't recall any atheists out there beheading people, stoning women to death, or burning people at the stake. <clears throat> they did all of that, and worse, during the communist and World War II stuff. <laughs> We're so good. You know what? We are such good, virtuous white Europeans who run the world through science, sometimes scientific technocracy. We're the greatest. And yeah, we're not being judged because we don't believe in God, so we just do whatever we want to do. Wait till we get to the name Lucy. That's coming. We're accused of not being spiritual. Look at that moon rise over the moon, or that earth rise over the moon. We're accused of not being spiritual. We have a religion. It's NASA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the Babylonian origin story and the Babylonian astrologers. You don't think we're spiritual? Look at this picture NASA took. We worship the universe. We're spiritual. This is our this this is our magic right here. This is our religion. Hmm? Does that move you? Does that touch you? Does that titillate you? Does that excite you? Walking home where I live in San Francisco now most of the time, feeling the heavy fog caress my face as I go home at night, watching nesting birds and chicks born in a, in a uh, window box. These are all moments of great inspiration and great spirituality. Our world is filled with endless moments of inspiration, real inspiration, 
available to each and every human being endowed with a conscious brain created by evolution. We need not rely on creation myths for inspiration. We all Do you see how stern he is? You need not rely on creation myths for inspiration. You can worship the universe. Be like Dawn. Also know that atheists play unfair. We're always accused of that. No, you can't teach creationism in my science class. Well, if you're going to teach creationism, as we all have said, why don't we teach astrology with astronomy? And that would end up with something like this. Here's an astrology chart. If you are Aries, the answer... The... No, Don, that's another false dichotomy or false binary. Um, creationism isn't like astrology. Now, if you wanted to be honest, intellectually honest, and say if you wanted to teach biblical creationism, um, then what would you teach Islam and Hinduism? And the answer to that would be yes, Don. In the speculative origins class, you can teach all of the creation myths or creation beliefs. Yeah, that's fine. People could choose on their own what to believe. Yeah, not astrology. Nice false binary, though. Stars and planets will not affect your life in any way. It's not... <laughs> He's into astrology. He's into Babylonian astrology. He just said, I look at this... You don't think I'm spiritual? Look at this picture NASA took. He's into astrology. And he said, you believe in creation? That's the same as astrology. False binary. Right. Right. And of course, then in medical school, we'd have to teach witchcraft along with medicine. And in chemistry class, alchemy and chemistry. Interesting that he said witchcraft in medicine. Where's it going to end? Okay, you American Airlines pilots, today we're going to discuss the flat earth. <laughs> so you get on a plane in Los Angeles, you're hoping to go see a metropolitan opera in New York, and the pilot believes in the flat earth, you'll never get there. <laughs> I think our main duty in getting to one of the really core issues of what I'm talking about tonight is to reawaken, as the advert will say, a reverence. I'll, I'll use that word. I'll take that word for the natural world and our place in the natural world. To respect the creativity of the true creator, Mother Nature. To protect her, to take responsibly our responsibilities as the most creative as well as the most destructive species that has ever lived on Earth. Our true creator, he says, Mother Nature. Yes, you need to worship the earth and the mother nature. You ever wonder why it's mother nature? If you didn't wonder that, it's the goddess and it's the opposite of father. Mm -hmm. The true creator. Thanks, Don, for your scientific um, insight here. Worship the true creator. He can't, it can't get worse, can it? The future is in our hands and it is time that we stop turning our back on the natural world and started listening to her and working with her. Her. Um, not sure what the next... Yes. So, one of our favorite places, the Creation Museum. Boss, you better get down here. I would love to do this. This would be the best Halloween thing I could imagine to do <laughs> at the wonderful Creation Museum. And uh, we're going to move into just a few illustrations of Lucy, I was asked too, but of course you go there. Where else can you witness the science of cavemen cavorting with their favorite pet dinosaur, Skippy, 5,000 years ago? I mean, did these, is this a time warp and we're back in the dark ages or something? This is lying, cheating, deceiving, warping, perverting people's knowledge to make what? Money. How much money does the Creation Museum make and at the same time destroys young people's opportunities to look at the world through an open mind? That's what upsets me probably more than anything else about The Creation Museum um, obviously is a problem for this guy. You, if you teach these kids creation, 
you're going to warp their minds and close their minds. Think of all the amazing things they could learn to do if you just if they didn't believe in God, right? You could be you're the next Donald Johansson. Um, yeah, I'm running out of energy to just be mad about it, but yeah, creating man, uh, we created God in our own image. The true creator is Mother Nature. We got to worship her. Um, and uh, if you teach your children to believe in God, you've limited their potential to use their brain the and have an open mind. Museum. Okay. And of course, I thought I'd show you the great breakthroughs in science from Marie Curie to the great accelerators and how much has been accomplished in religion. It. <clears throat> so, uh, <laughs> let's see here. Whatever they're doing here, I don't know. She looks like she has scales. Uh, I forget what Marie Curie did. I don't know. Something with uh, computers, maybe. Then they show NASA, of course. Look at what science has done. They put this dude on the moon in this rinky-dink cardboard box. And then the particle collider, which is really interesting that they use these things. Like, I wonder how much intention there is with uh, the Large Hadron Particle Collider there. Look at what science has done. This has no application to anybody's life. Zero. Zero. Nothing they've done at um, CERN has uh, contributed to anyone's life other than their very expensive uh, super tunnel and trying to disprove God. And uh, going to space is zero effect as well. So, I mean, whatever. Yeah, you've really come a long way. Anyways, nice, ex nice examples. <laughs> Well, part of my mission in life mission. has been to educate people about the fossil evidence for human evolution. Mm. And a creationist asked me to give the single most important talk that I've given in years. This is about Francis Collins. I'm going to fast forward a little When a couple of you know, real scientists, in white coats and name tags and all that, came over and they said, oh, we just wanted to tell you how much we enjoyed your talk. We had no idea there was this much evidence for human origins. <laughs> because she said, we, all we do, we peer through these electron microscopes and look at, you know, microscopic things and we don't look at the big picture. I wonder if he actually provided scientific evidence for this, because he never has. He just goes on this ramble. I've heard him do about 10 of these. And thank you for coming here and helping us understand who we are, where we've come from, and why we should be so happy about being humans. Thank you, Don, for teaching me where I really came from, how we got here, what we're doing here. These are the things that the Bible answers. Uh, my mom used to say, um, who are you? What are you doing here? Who are you? How did you get here? What are you doing? How did you get here? Who are you? Well, I forget, or something like that. Who are you? What are you doing here? How did you get here? Something like that. This is what the Bible tells you, right? Don's freed you from that. Thank you, Don, for telling me, telling us how we really got here. You found a hip bone that you broke and you, you know, whatever fit it into your worldview. And now I know that I'm just a human and uh, I'm a mutated chimpanzee in a meaningless universe. Thank you, Don. Thank you for enlightening me. That was un unbelievable satisfaction. Well, think of all... Oh, so... This is a first shot of Hadar, Ethiopia, that I saw in 1972. And it was a spiritual moment for me. Looking mm. out on these vast badlands, heavily dissected, eroding layer after layer, rich in fossils. I was just leaving, I was still in graduate school at the University of Chicago, and this to me was, we shouldn't use that word epiphany, but for me it certainly was. And as we began to search those deposits, I was asked to say a few words, and it will only be a few words. You see me in the background, much thinner than I am today, and my graduate student, who of course, graduate students do all the work, so he's down there working. <laughs> and uh, I had been walking back to my Land Rover, glanced over my right shoulder. It's a story I've told a gazillion times. I'm not great at reading body language, but I just, I don't believe this story. I'm sorry, I don't believe this story. Watch his little mannerisms here. This is the story of how he found uh, Lucy, and then we're going to get into the name because this is where he says how he named it. ...than I am today. Watch it. Watch and face. my graduate student, who, of course, graduate students do all the work, so he's down there working. 
And uh, I had been walking back to my Land Rover, glanced over my right shoulder, it's a story I've told a gazillion times, and glanced and saw a piece of arm bone from the elbow. And that little fragment of bone, which allows you to flex and extend your arm, was the first piece of Lucy that I recognized. And I knew that because of all the studies and so on in graduate school in anatomy and bones, osteology, and so on and so forth. And we were rewarded with this 3.2 million year old skeleton. I want to point out that she found, he found her sticking out of the ground, <laughs> just like uh, Paul Sereno. Why would anybody believe in the geologic column? You debate the atheists and they go, the scientists, not even the atheists, the scientists, and they go, oh, yeah, we have this date, we have this date. If you have three million year old fossils sticking out of the ground or also 20 feet or 50 feet deep, how can you possibly assume that you have a, a dependable column? I love when Kent Hoban says that the only place a geologic column exists is in textbooks. Okay, keep going, Don. Sticking out of the ground, by the way. Just happened to be. That picked lucky. up the popular moniker of Lucy after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds that was, came from the uh, Beatles tape that was playing that evening. A woman on the expedition said, well, if you think it's a female, Don, why don't you call her Lucy? And I said, excuse me, I'm a PhD. <laughs> we don't give cute little names to our fossils. Okay. This is where this is going to get fun. <clears throat> I promised you a little VOR rant, a little conspiracy rabbit hole. <sighs> Lucy. See, my name is Luke, and I know what it means. And my last name also means basically the same thing. It means light. Um, the root word for Lucifer. It, Lucy is lu loose. It's L-U-C. Uh, they call the uh, first common ancestor, the, the last uh, universal common ancestor, they call her Luca. Right? I've made videos on this. Mm-hmm. Well, in the best case scenario, Donald got this name from a Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The Beatles, right? Worst case scenario, it's named absolutely after Lucifer, the light bearer, the enlightened one. So it's like a choose your own adventure here. It's a one version is that it's named after Lucifer, quite literally. And the other one is that it's named after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I'm not sure if there's really a differentiation between those two. Let me go to this here. Turns out, unsurprisingly, that this Lucy character might have been a boy. Mm-hmm. If you've ever researched the, like, uh, Madame Blavatsky, Deo and Deo Reverso, I wouldn't look into that, uh, as above, so below. The satanic energies, uh, it's big about yin and yang, the juxtaposition, white and dark. It's the balance, right? It's uh, sweet and savory. It's torture and sexual pleasure. It's like all, it's like, uh, they do all these things, right? Aleister Crowley and Babylonian magic and stuff. It's it's a they they put the two opposing things together, so if you've ever seen Baphomet, it's um a hermaphrodite right breasts and a, it's a male figure with breasts, uh, it's both. So it's Lucy actually turned out being a boy. They couldn't call him Lucy though, right? Lucy or Lucifer, gender confusion. In the Pliocene. This is 1998, by the way. Hausler and Schmidt challenged the long held opinion that AL 288, known as Lucy, was female. They concluded that it was most probably male, Lucifer. The female is Lucy and the male is Lucifer. It's, uh, Lucy was probably a male and uh, was probably named Lucifer. 
Okay, let's just go a little bit further on this. Now, if you're watching this and um, this scene is cut out, I apologize. Some people can play 20 seconds of a movie and get away with it. I can't normally. But this is a scene, the Lucy time travel scene, and you can just skip ahead to 1 minute and 39 seconds, where Lucy, who gains uh, sentience, omniscience, she gains, she goes from sentient to omniscient. She becomes a god through drugs, basically. It's very much their thing, right? It's like Nimrod began to become a Giborim through science, Babylonian fallen angel magic, using science to become a god. This is what Donald Johansson's interested in, uh, Ray Kurzweil, all of them, transhumanism, etc., Becoming like God, becoming a God, right? Nothing new under the sun. So in this movie, Lucy, where she becomes a God, in this scene, she goes back in time. She's hanging out with the dinosaurs and she travels back to meet this character, right? Which is Lucy. I'm going to try and block it out so they don't copyright me. She reaches out her finger Lucy reaches out her finger to Lucy, double Lucy, and they touch fingers, which is um, a ripoff of the, uh, what is it, Michelangelo painting, right? I mean, we could do this together. Um, I think it's Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Sorry, my brain's goofy tonight, so... Uh, Adam and God painting. Right. So they do this guy here. And then in this scenario, God reaches down and touches Adam's finger, right? And gives him life. That's that thing. So in the movie Lucy, so in the movie Lucy, the same thing happens, except for it's Lucy who through science became a God went back in time with her new deistic powers and touched the chimpanzee, which wasn't evolving apparently, it was just a chimpanzee, which caused the evolution of man. Hmm? That's this story. Oh, look, bingo bongo. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy, for evolving humans from chimpanzees yeah it turns out it was lucifer that did that have you ever heard the story of prometheus prometheus uh i don't even have this prometheus uh story Let's see if i can do it really quickly Prometheus is best known for defying the Olympian gods by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge, and more generally civilization. Uh, he is credited with the creation of humanity from the clay. So uh, humans were like uh, animals and he touched them and they became like humans and he gave them fire and then the big gods were mad at him and then he ends up being basically crucified as children or his buddies cohorts end up locked in prison in hell in tartarus or whatever a bird picks at his thing and he refuses to disobey god it's prometheus is lucifer the light bearer it's just what it is so prometheus is lucifer the light bearer the movie lucy shows lucy touching the chimp and causing it to evolve and the name of lucy he's probably was a male and they would have called him lucifer so now you've got you've got Don Johansson saying, "Oh, we just named it after the Beatles. That's all we did. Just a little Beatles ditty." I'm going to show a couple clips here um, from a Beatles thing. Um, now. This is a little bit kind of corny Christian, you know, like a, like watch DC Park or what was it, DC Talk, and then the Beatles are bad. So like I, don't, I almost don't want to use this, but he covers quite a bit. There's some B-roll here that I need to use. So check this out. The Beatles were a big deal, right? And what's crazy is my wife and I were talking about the Beatles the other day, and I was saying they're good at music, but neither of us really liked them. The Beatles didn't just play music. 
And I imagine, even though this guy's got it on his video, YouTube's not going to allow me to play it. But anyways, I'm going to try. Check this out. Ooh, I got to turn this down first. Or it's going to blast you guys. Thanks, Don, for recording such a quiet deal. Here we go. Miss of sex, Eastern mysticism, and Satanism. Or the Beatles. If I do play it at that speed, maybe it'll actually knock it dinged. Here we go. Came around, everybody freaked. They just loved the look, they loved the music. It really revolutionized the way people dressed. It revolutionized the way people wore their hair. It started, I think, a revolution in America. It is hard to overestimate the impact that the Beatles had on the world at large, as youth by the millions were given a form of emotional shock treatment. They influenced everything that I... I bet you that's really loud. Let me turn that down just a hair. The girls swooning and stuff, that always seemed spiritual, didn't it? Continue. I've ever done. I even remember, you know, growing up hearing Beatles songs, and all their songs are timeless. They built the structure for rock and roll. Beatles actually were bringing everybody along with them on their voyage of their discovery. Beatles went out and took the world by storm. I grew up with them. They helped us grow up. They got me arrested three or four times. I think they did a lot for society. But those songs are in my memory banks for the, I think they're actually in my genetic material. All-time favorite musical group. Beatles. Beatles. If they dressed a certain way, everybody wanted to be like that. When the That's Beatles true. got long hair, I got long hair. The fact that my mother didn't like it was an enormous part of its appeal. No. Millions were seduced by the music and image of the Beatles to trade in their biblical values for Crowleyan ideals. I had this theory that the Beatles were actually the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, that insofar as they changed the entire face of the planet. If people know it or not, they've all been influenced by the Beatles, you know, in our generation, because we've, we've grown up having that be a normal part of our culture. Reluctance to go back to an old deferential culture. Whether you know it or not, the Beatles changed everything. Like everything you do, everything you believe, everything that we partake in, the Beatles <laughs> were involved. Like this whole sex, drugs, rock and roll, God of the Bible, stupid. Um, they were very, very, very instrumental. And when they came over here in exactly the 60s, right? This is, I've done a 60s conspiracy before on this channel. That was when everything changed, right? That was the destruction of God's order. That was when it really started. Women's Lib was funded by the CIA to get the children out of the house. The baby boomers are here. And they're raised by the state, and you introduce them to the Beatles, and it's a whole thing. It's a, I don't have enough time to go into the whole thing. But, yeah, they were very um, uh, influential on sexuality and rebellion, largely. Rebelling um, against the, the the baby boomers. Rebe like This is what I mean by it's affected everything. The Beatles were uh, implicit in the baby boomers rebelling against the authority structure, which was Christianity and their parents. And the Beatles were panamount in that. Is exactly you could see what the Beatles represent. Because if the Beatles were one thing, they were disrespectful. The 1960s were the perfect time for Satan to introduce his revolution. He had already established his groundwork through men like Harry Hay and Kinsey and Timothy Leary. Both Kennedy and Martin Luther King were shot dead. And they... Kinsey, by the way, I've covered that a little bit. Kinsey was the father of the sexual revolution. And he used to party with and hang out with, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, at Aleister Crowley's place, uh, the wickedest man, Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger and Kinsey hung out um, in Crowley's place in Italy that Mussolini had kicked him out of and painted, whitewashed. Um, Kenneth Anger and Kinsey, I've been wanting to make a video on this, went in and scratched all of the paint off to reveal all of the satanic hell mouths and stuff that um, Crowley had painted everywhere. Kinsey was involved in this as well. It's crazy. The 60s, it's, it's a whole other video I have to do. Environment was ripe for revolution as the baby boomer generation was living in a spiritual vacuum. What was happening at the same time was, of course, the boomer generation growing up. And so you suddenly had a very large, very young population, really for the first time. And the music just fed into that. So you've got all these things coming together, and then, then you always have to add to that the imponderable factor of individual brilliance. Yoko Ono said that the Beatles were not aware of all that was coming through them. She said they were like four mediums at a seance who had gathered together and a spirit appeared and channeled through them. Of yoking with pagan gods. 
God's word warns that these false gods are actually demonic beings, and Jesus Christ and warned against the repetitious praying of the pagans. Information is important. Well, before the Beatles came around, I don't think Indian spirituality and things like that were an everyday part of Western culture. It was entirely the hippies, you know, thanks to the Beatles, who decided to, you know, go to India and, you know, discover yoga and meditation. Now we all have yoga on every corner. You know, there was never anything like that before they came along. They really wanted a spiritual revolution, a, a transformation. I mean, look people like the Beatles they don't like the Beatles people have had the Holy Spirit like tell them like there's something off about them I don't know whatever's going on I'm not trying to say don't listen to the Beatles I'm just talking about <laughs> Donald Johansson either named this thing after Lucifer or he named it after Lucy and this guy with diamonds and of course it's the Beatles keep going it was time for a, a generation to assert themselves and this is the revolution that the Beatles caused. This revolution was challenged after John Lennon claimed to be more popular than Jesus Christ. This was a wake-up call to many young people around the world as they took to the streets and publicly destroyed the Beatle albums. Don't you forget what the Beatles have said. Don't forget to take your Beatle records and your Beatle paraphernalia to any one of our 14 pickup points. My ancestors. Sadly, this wake-up call did not last very long as society at large fell back asleep and the Beatles would launch their next assault with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, uh, there's a really cool conspiracy that Sgt. Pepper was Aleister Crowley and the Beatles were his Lonely Hearts Club Band. And I've researched it quite a bit. I've even covered it a little bit, but just, again, I'm kind of out of conspiracy, unfortunately. But yeah, he legitimately said that he sold his soul to the devil. John Lennon did. Um, he said, do what th you like as long as you hurt no one. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole law of the land. Um, he said, Christianity, this is what he said. Sound a little bit like um, Donald Johansson here. Christianity will go, Lennon said, according to Cleve's article. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Maybe it's just a coincidence that this was named after Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds. Death. Albert Goldman reported in his book, The Lives of John Lennon, quote, Finally, it was time to consummate all these spells by making a living sacrifice and signing a pact with the devil. For Lena was not a white witch. She was the real thing, a practitioner of black magic. There was no knowing what she planned to do to seal the bond with Lucifer. All she would say was that a witch's moon was nigh and they had to make ready for the sacrifice. Lena said, quote, we've got to make a sacrifice with the blood of an innocent to the one who has the power. They sacrificed an animal to Satan, and Yoko ended up paying the Satan his $60,000. The price, though, would be far more for serving Satan. It would cost John Lennon his life and his soul. Yoko Ono said of the Beatles, quote, something did happen there. It was as if several people gathered around a table and a ghost appeared. It was that kind of communication. So they were like mediums in a way. It was more than four people. As I said, they were like mediums. They weren't conscious of all they were saying, but it was coming through them. Okay. I'm not going to go too much further down the Beatles thing, but what you have here is, like, we all have heard the cover story, right? The cover story is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is LSD. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. According to Lennon, that isn't what he was saying. He named it after his daughter's paper or something. Being that they were likely or at to some level consigned to um, working for Sergeant Pepper, uh, potentially, you know, this Crowley and Satanic, like real occult stuff, um, to be Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, it could have been Lucifer from the beginning. I don't mean to like just poke and, you know, pick and choose, but 
their intention was to break the old guard of Christianity. That's a big thing they were into doing. And um, you would be hard-pressed to get me to believe that Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds isn't about Lucifer and the other fallen angels that left heaven. You know, shooting star kind of thing. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, I think that's prob that's based just kind of contextually in how they, how they uh, operated spiritually, bringing, you know, this uh, Eastern mysticism, mis Eastern mysticism and attacking Christianity and trying to free the baby boomers from Christ. Like, they were a big deal in this. So, Donald, of course, like, now I want to go back to Donald. Um, it's just, man, I'm so glad you guys, I don't know. I was going to say I'm glad you don't see the world like I do, but I make you see the world with, like I do when I share these kind of things. But this is the, when I, when I do research, I've been doing this for so long and I hear, like, I see Lucy, I immediately, I'm like, yeah, hey, I know, I know, I know about this Lucy stuff. I'm like, I bet you Lucy... I bet it was named after Lucifer. And I do a search. Yeah, it was a boy named Lucifer. And he goes, yeah, we just I got lucky. I walked out there and I found the elbow sticking. Th th we just got lucky. It was fortunate. And we just happened to be listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So I named it Lucy. BS. I call BS Donald Johansson, who I do not trust any further than I can throw. And he looks like he's bigger than me. And I don't think I can throw him very far. I don't, I don't trust your story. I don't trust anything you're saying right now. And I don't believe... That that song was playing in the background, and they they the people that worked around you called it Lucy because it was just on repeat. And if it was, it's because you guys were doing some weird thing. That's my take, anyways. Of Lucy after Lucy in the sky with diamonds. That... Let me turn this volume back up again. Thanks, Don. I don't know if he's passed, but he's haunting me from the grave by having that be so quiet. really would have made this job a little easier today. Okay, here we go. Extend your arm was the first piece of Lucy that I recognized. And I knew that because of all the studies and so on in graduate school in anatomy and bones, osteology and so bones, on. Bones, so I know about bones. And we were rewarded with this 3.2 million year rewarded. old skeleton that picked up they the popular moniker of Lucy after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds that was, came from the uh, Beatles tape that was playing that evening. This woman on the expedition said, well, if you think it's a female, Don, why don't you call her Lucy? And I said, excuse me, I'm a PhD. <laughs> we don't give cute little names to our fossils. Well, well, you know what happens when the genie's out of the lamp. Oh, the next morning, are we going back to the Lucy site? You think we'll find more of Lucy's skeleton? How old do you think Lucy was when she became, a, she became an individual? And she is iconic. Everybody, you know, a lot of people think she's the dinosaur at Chicago, which is Sue, but Lucy, is really the poster child for paleoanthropology and human origins. When you read about new discoveries, they're either older than Lucy or younger than Lucy or more complete than Lucy or not as primitive as Lucy or whatever. So this was a remarkable discovery for me. It launched an incredible 20-year series of expeditions for paleoanthropology and human origins. When you read about new discoveries, they're either older than Lucy or younger than Lucy or more complete than Lucy or not as primitive as Lucy or whatever. So this was a remarkable discovery for me. It launched an incredible 20-year series of expeditions. We now have over 400 specimens of her species, Australopithecus afarensis, and it also stimulated science he said they have 400 specimens. They have 400 fragments of bones. Dawn. 400 specimens. Just to be very clear, they haven't found 400 Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus fossils. They found 400 shards that they claim are Australopithecus. Here, listen to that again. Australopithecus afarensis, and it also stimulated scientists, mostly young scientists, as it always is, the silverbacks like myself are more reluctant to change, but uh, to develop new methodologies and ways of understanding, examining, and studying these specimens. So she did play a very important role 
uh, beginning in 1974. Well, if you go to the Creation Museum, there she is. She's a four-legged, walking, quadrupedal knuckle walker. This is going to really chap his butt, his white European butt. Um, this is the Creation Museum showing how they manipulated the hip bone, and she was probably just a chimpanzee. I want you to notice in this picture, I want you to notice how um, in the Creation Museum, how um, reserved this is. You don't see any genitalia, right? It's just uh, like, you know, behind the butt is like this thing, this like poster, and you, he's got his legs, she's got his legs together, her legs together, and she's got no breasts. I want you to think of that like this, the next part of this is going to be kind of gross, but I have to address it. Because of Dr. Ham. I don't know what he got his doctorate in, but it may have been one of those things you get at Sears. Um, but There's a little ad hom on um, Ken Ham. But there ain't no way that Lucy was walking on her knuckles on four legs. So a child goes in and... <clears throat> he knows he's full of it. He knows he, he's, at, he's not a good game. I've gambled enough. He's got a terrible poker face. He, he knows he's just saying the things that he wants to say and he's not backing it up with anything. Watch this. Let's see the science, uh, Donald Johansson. Let's see the science here. Um, but there ain't no way that Lucy was walking on her knuckles. There ain't no way. Science. Science. There ain't no way. There ain't no way. And then he looks, watch his face here. On four legs. So a child goes in. A child goes in. And what happens, Don, when the child goes in? And sees this in a suppressed by The child doesn't know one way or another. Hmm. My grandchild, Brendan. The child. <sighs> That's it. He's a hypocrite. I'm saying it. Take that sound bite. Take that clip. Atheist. A child walks in. To this thing that Ken Ham, who got his doctorate from Sears, created and doesn't know any better and believes that that's what Lucy looked like? Well, there ain't no way Lucy walked on her hands and on her knuckles. Ain't no way, Ken Ham. Went to the California Academy of Sciences. He's three years old with his father Great. and his father said well let's take a picture next to Lucy where, where your grandfather the, the thing you found that he found and he refused to have his picture taken until I would come stand next to it and he knows that Lucy walked up right doesn't bother him he, he knows he's three years old he's a baby he knows Lucy walked up right it doesn't bother him because what Don because of your science because of the science you showed him or is it possible that the thing you just said just said a minute ago when you said a child's going to walk in here and see this and believe it because they trust the people they go with and they trust the person doing the exhibit why does your three-year-old believe this dawn because of the science holy moses because of the science dawn does a three-year-old know this because of the science or because he's the same child you talked about but he's looking at the diorama that you made instead of the diorama that ken ham made which is it? He didn't bother him that she's very old. It didn't bother him. He thought it was so neat that she came from apes. So it's terribly important that we don't shut these minds down so early. You're just going to have a three-year-old walk in there and see this Ken Ham thing, and they're going to believe it? That's not fair. That's not science. You're going to shut their minds down. But you can have your three-year-old look at our Lucy, and they can believe that. See, that's science. That's science. Hopefully you guys are starting to understand what is so frustrating to me about all of this, what we're up against here. Okay. 
Smithsonian, Lucy's Legacy, celebrating the 48th anniversary of her discovery with a selfie. The iconic ancient homonym gets her hands on a smartphone in anticipation of the museum's upcoming exhibit exploring the global impact of cell phones. There she is. Tits out. Mm -hmm. Naked Lucy. So the Creation Museum has a chimp that was likely probably a chimp if you don't alter the hips with no genitalia, fully furry. If you think my son's not going to a natural history museum, I can guarantee you that. Chloe took him to a, a science thing at one point and there she was like, oh yeah, it's just all like the Big Bang and this natural science nonsense. Um, it, not until he's uh, grown up enough to decide that he, he doesn't have to have a hairy naked woman dancing around in his subconscious for the rest of his life. Let me just give you a parenting tip here. Okay. Um, the chimp may have been upright, may have been a knuckle dragger. Um, you may take your child to see the thing based on, you know, your worldview. Cause we, you know, the, the parents kind of, they're going to influence the child and what they believe. Let's just say either our belief systems and you can teach them to believe whatever one. Let's just say. Taking them to see a naked one with actual human breasts, a version of human breasts. Making a kiss face, taking a selfie of her naked self. That's not appropriate for children, Dawn. So your whole complaint that you just had there about somebody walking into Ken Ham's Creation Museum... and it being somehow offensive to the gods of science. And it's actually, it's, it's worse. It's even worse. It's even worse. This is the, this is the uh, museum, American Natural History Museum, which was exactly built by the eugenicists, uh, funded by J.P. Morgan. I've covered it before. You walk into the origins, right? The hall of our origins. Ah! Walking around, look, we definitely came from here. That's definitely a guy that was we were related to. That's definitely tree monkeys that we were related to. Definitely that one. Here's some arms. See, look at our arms are similar. Proof of this is the kind of this is what. <laughs> yep. Here's a cast of an arm that kind of looks like another arm. So we definitely came from the same place. Walking around, walking around, and we get to Lucy. Look, the star species, the star of the show, Lucy, which. See, she certainly didn't walk up right like that. If she if she was this transitionary fossil, it would have been kind of a middling gate kind of thing. This is I mean, this absolutely, even according to their narrative, misrepresents scientifically what they believe. It was a, a, a little bit of a gate. It wasn't a do 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 with human hands. Nope. Would have had chimp hands. Uh, white sclera looking human hanging out with his Lucy and Lucifer together again, going on an effing date. Want to take a naked selfie next? Um, this is uh, Lu this is uh, Lucy here with her boobs. This is Lucifer here with his little Lou. Oh. That's a hairy penis. I imagine an adult ancestor. Yeah. Hey, mom. What's that? Oh, it's uh, oh, rhetorically. Um, it's Lucifer's penis. Yeah, it's fine. And Baphomet's breasts. Hey, but science. I don't know why. I just was into like animals and sexuality for some reason I don't know it's like I don't remember what happened to me I was like a kid I don't know I just wanted to see like naked animals and like weird stuff like I don't know like, at least my first sexual impulse was seeing the genitalia of these half human hybrids parents this is okay right Dawn don't let 
Lucy that was probably scientifically accurate. Don't let the kids see that because that's bad for them. But your three-year-old needs to see this. Yeah. Now, I have seen a video of the kids looking at this. I couldn't find it, and I had to get ready for the show. But I have a video just like this somewhere on YouTube where the kids are looking at the thing, looking at the pictures or the, the diorama. Go over here a little bit more. There's some scully things. And here's, um, you know, vulture and also... Um, this one seems to have a more accurate female physique. Yeah. And he's uh, anatomically correct as well. You can kind of see it behind his arm there. She's all the way down. She's obviously, they live in the bush. You take your child. In Donald Johansson's backwards, illogical, hypocritical mind, you take your child to the Creation Museum and you've ruined their brain. And uh, you take them to the American Natural History Museum to see this bestiality smut. I don't mean to sound like super evangelical here, but... And that's science. Yeah, you got to keep their mind open because you don't want them to become... He says a bigot in a minute here. He talks about how they would become a bigot if they didn't see naked half-human apes. <sighs> Two Peter three, right? Their evil deeds denying creation. There's actually, I'm sorry to go so far down this road. I tried to warn you. I should have given you more of a warning. There's actually um, uh, an intentional um, trying to sexualize uh, younger people agenda that goes on. Uh, I think they're into it. Like Don's probably into it. He's probably yeah. Check us out. Like take the three year old to go see the thing. It's fine. You get that. You get a weird feeling. Yeah, it's cool. You'll get to explore that someday. You got to keep your mind open. Remember, you're three, but hey, got to just deal with this imaginary thing and make them naked and make you look at it. I'm going to go back and watch this. I just, I want you to hear him talk about how mad he is that the kids at the Creation Museum are seeing this Lucy thing. She's a four legged walking quadrupedal knuckle walker because of Dr. Ham. I don't know what he got his doctorate in, but it may have been one of those oh, things. That's not playing. I'm sorry. Luke's screensaver again. I gotta stop doing that. I really need a producer. She's a four legged walking quadrupedal. New methodologies and ways of understanding, examining, and studying these specimens. So she did play a very important role uh, beginning in 1974. Well, if you go to the Creation Museum, there she is. She's a four-legged walking quadrupedal knuckle walker because of Dr. Ham. I don't know what he got his doctorate in, but it may have been one of those things you get at Sears. Um, but there ain't no way that Lucy was walking on her knuckles on four legs. So a child goes in and sees this in a suppressed pipe. The child doesn't know one way or another. My grandchild, Brendan, went to the California Academy of Sciences. He's three years old with his father. And his father said, well, let's take a picture next to Lucy, where, you, where your grandfather, the, the thing you found, that he found. And he refused to have his picture taken until I would come stand next to it. And he knows that Lucy walked up, right? Doesn't bother him. He didn't bother him that she's very old. It didn't bother him. He thought it was so neat that she came from apes. So it's terribly important that we don't shut these minds down so early. Because as you shut them, the longer you have a mind that's shut down, the more time there is for bigotry to develop. The three-year-old was scared to stand next to the naked, hairy thing. 
And Grandpa says, no, I found her. And uh, science. And plus, I don't want you to be a bigot. So I have to, you have to look at naked half-beasts when you're three. This is... I got two more rants to go. And then I'm going to wrap you up. Found, he found. And he refused to have his picture taken until I would come stand next to it. And he knows that Lucy walked up, right? Doesn't bother him. He's he didn't three. bother he him that she's very old. It didn't bother him. He thought it was so neat that she came from apes. Right. So it's terribly important that we don't shut these minds down so early. Because as you shut them, the longer you have a mind that's shut down, the more time there is for bigotry to develop. An absolutely arbitrary, hypocritical thing for you to wrap up on, Donald Johansson. What on God's green earth does teaching a child that they're definitely chimpanzees related to chimpanzees whatever you want to say and evolution definitely created us what what how is there any exclu exclusivity between that and bigotry do you know don where a lot of our bigotry originally came from those people are different than us those people are different than us it's a threat and initially it was actually a functionally thing a functioning thing because the tribe that you trusted could come and take everything all your resources and everything so you had to not trust them and they looked differently than you and it was okay because like i don't know if i can trust you and then you would like earn your respect or whatever and you'd be like oh we can trust them going into modernity modernity What's happened is they taught eugenics and the theory of evolution and we're all animals. And according to his people, uh, Darwin and Huxley and uh, uh, all of these the white Europeans, they taught that the subhumans were colored, basically. So bigotry and evolution are synonymous, Donald, not creation, where we're all Adam and Eve's uh, descendants of Adam and Eve uh, made in the image of God. Yep. The, the biblical account is that we are all related, literally, and that we are made in the image of the living God and that we need to be good to one another. Yeah, that's the opposite of bigotry. But evolution taught eugenics, which I know I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, this is just, I just did a Google search, Jim Crow South and eugenics. Eugenics explained all differences in human intelligence, character, and temperament as matters of heredity. This is University of, Malta, of uh, Maryland, Baltimore. Seems like it should be the opposite of that. UVA in the history of race. Eugenics and r the racial integrity. Okay. Uh, by the start of the 20th century, the University of Virginia had become a center of an emergency, emergent, emerging new strain of racism, eugenics. The Nazis studied eugenics and Jim Crow laws as a model. Americans embraced eugenics and the Nazis picked it up. The historian Peter Hayes said in the documentary that many of the U.S. Have, uh, this provides some evidence that the effects of eugenics on black Americans were tied to the Jim Crow South. Yep. I'm just processing this with you guys. I'm beginning to think that his whole worldview is based on anti-truth. Like, if I lie, call me out. I know I said that earlier. But to make the connection that teaching children in biblical creation makes them bigoted, when it was literally his theory and the people that pushed his theory that created American bigotry, is not intellectually dishonest. Dawn. Subjecting three-year-olds to your belief system where you tell them that we descend from apes and having them look at naked diorama versions of these human hybrids isn't better than Ken Ham, who probably has the actual, and I'm not a Ken Ham guy, but probably has the skeleton not broken and reassembled, probably built it the way that they found it as an extinct chimp or whatever it actually is that's fully clothed in fur. Doing the Ken Ham version isn't going to result in a worse scenario than this Don Johansson approved version where the kid is scared. The kids are excited to see the Lucy and the Ken and the Ken Ham model. Yeah, like, oh, that's cool. It's like a fuzzy thing. Is it going to be talking? It's like one of those singing bear things we used to see when we were kids. 
And then it's like, the three-year-old's like, what is that naked human thing? Don's like, it's okay. I found it. That's your aunt. The kid's like, I don't like it. It's like, I'll take a picture with you. And the kid's like, that's not better, Don. We live in a bizarre upside down world. We live in bizarre upside down world. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I can't. Do, I can't. It's not better, Don. Your version is not better. It's not right. It's not the truth. It's a th theory. I'm sorry it's not fact. I know you want it to be. Because your whole thing is just trying to disbelieve in the God of the Bible. Your whole worldview is based on anti-truth. I'm done with it. But I'm not done with the video. There's one more thing I've had to show. Like, this is the, the grand conclusion. I told you it could be two parts. Oh well. Going away party for the studio. Marathon. Double disc set. Um, all of these creation myths, or many of them, and here you see he's saying, look, it's not personal, it's religious. <laughs> there have been so many sacrifices in religion. Whether it's, you know, burning at the stake or beheading people or stoning people to death or ripping their heart out and eating live pumping heart or whatever it is if you're an Aztec. And what's that left us with? A bunch of dead bodies. Didn't do much to stop the volcanic eruption. The drought never ended. Didn't dispel the locust invasion, did it? No. Did nothing. Yet you're going to be surprised that tonight I'm going to propose that all of us begin to make some real sacrifices. What might those sacrifices be? You guys have gone down this uh, road of discovery with me. What do you think Don, our boy Don's going to say here? I think he's going to say that sacrificing things in the name of religion is terrible, bigoted, can't do it, shouldn't do it. There's no way he's going to promote sacrificing things for his God, right? There's no way. I bet you know what he's going to do. Clean up the oceans. Quit throwing everything just because it disappears into oceans. Quit throwing everything. Oops. Sorry. Us begin to make some real sacrifices. What might those sacrifices be? Clean up the oceans. Quit throwing everything just because it disappears into oceans. Stop fishing out species that you think will forever be present and available to you. Last time you saw orange roughy on a menu, huh? 20 years ago, gone. Make some real sacrifices, sacrifices to mother nature, who will, unlike the false gods to whom we have made sacrifices, mother nature will reward you. I guarantee that. Clean up the ocean. Shocker. Shocker. We've all seen this movie, right? Oh, the guy thought he was the good guy. He turned out being the bad guy. We've all seen this movie. Yep. Uh, can't worship God in the state, so... In order to be communist, you have to be atheist. And uh, we all serve a master. You're going to love one and hate the other. If you serve the master, your true God, your true creator, nature, mother nature, the true creator, who isn't judging you for your deviancy, you can't serve your mother nature, your goddess of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, um, and the God of the Bible, can you, Dawn? And you're fine with sacrifice to your God, but not. we can't do anything with our God, right? Your way, scientific fact, unquestioned fact. I hope you guys made it this far. I know this was a marathon. Um, he goes on to say some other things that I'm just not going to, whatever. There's like three minutes. You can watch the video yourself. Go watch the last three minutes and see what he says. Thanks for suffering uh, me 
uh, to be able to do this. I was really struggling with brain fog at the beginning, but um, I feel much better now. And um, that's I'm glad we kept going because I got a second wind. Look, we don't know if there's a God. We don't know if the universe created itself. Let me get this music going. But with every bit of confidence I have, you know, who knows how many recordings we'll be able to continue to do. It's definitely the last one in this studio. Uh, I'm convinced that the creator of this reality is the author of the Bible. Convinced. The scientific description, the historicity of Scripture, the prophecy, the interactions, the personal interactions we've all had with our God. The logical adherence to the laws of physics intuiting how this reality actually works. We are made in the image of the Creator who knows us and loves us. We aren't an accident. The universe isn't an accident. And we have been sold a bill of goods by Donald Johansson and co. People that aren't interested in the science. They're not, this isn't about the pursuit of truth. It's about using data to support a worldview. Even if they mean well by it, even if they're just like, yeah, you know what? I walked away from Christianity because I had a religiously traumatic upbringing or whatever, or I just want to do whatever I want to do. Like, I think the science supports this. It's not about the truth of science. It doesn't matter if it's Dr. Becky or Don or Blitz or McClellan or Sam Harris or um, who are the other guys? Lawrence Krauss or Stephen Hawking's. Epstein <clears throat> Island, you know, it's, um, it's the frustrating thing here is that they've executed convincing the world that if you're a good parent, you'll take them to see the naked Lucy and, uh, that's misrepresenting it standing upright, which it shouldn't with light, white sclera, which it shouldn't having human hands, which it shouldn't naked, which it shouldn't. That if you do this and you take your kid to the American Natural History Museum and you tell them their origin story, you've you've accomplished the goal of a, of a parent in 2024. You've made your child a secular materialist, which they need because they need you to serve their system. They need you to not have God because your God gets in their way. Hmm? Your God has always been in their way. The God of the Bible hates God. Uh, the elites using corruption to perpetuate their own existence at the cost of the working class. God uh, prophesied with Jeremiah uh, against Israel before they went into um, Babylonian captivity, ironically, um, serendipitously, more like it, more like it. Jesus, when he came here and there was the corrupt temple system, um, he hates corruption. Our God is just and he loves a fair and just scale and he hates a corrupt scale. Um, he hates his corruption. And they need to rip God out of the heart of your babies so they can reprogram them, reprogram them in the image of their materialist, pantheist, anarchist, against God anyways, um, do what thou wilt system. The Beatles, <laughs> this whole thing, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, survival of the fittest. This is, it's a battle for the hearts and minds of children, and we got to protect our babies. From Don Johansson and co., really. Share this with people who you want for them to think you're crazy <laughs> and a non-fit parent. I could turn this volume down. I'm going to do the closing music here. I haven't been able to do that recently because of... Uh, the way this YouTube live works. Thank you everybody for being here for the marathon. Um, 
I, it'll probably be a good month before I can do another YouTube live. We're working on the house. And so uh, we got to build a make the studio happen. So it'll probably be about a month. So you got two or three shows worth in one show. Uh, we'll still be on the TikTok lives Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday at nine. And uh, I'm working on like four projects right now. And hopefully I can get one of those airplanes to land. But we got a lot going on. Please keep us in your prayers up here in VOR camp. We need you. We need your prayers. Um, we couldn't do it without you. So we love you guys. Thank you everybody for being here. and transmission.